Hi, my name is Danielle, Danny for short, and this is not exactly a good time. Smile, Danny. Don't make us feel bad. Yeah, I'm so happy to be sent away out of your sight. Don't get us wrong, darling. You're gonna love this school, right, honey? Yes, it's a prestigious school for children of affluent families. Your mother and I loved our time at Kingsbury as well. Because it was perfect for you. Trust me, I'm nothing like you. But one day you'll thank us for keeping you off the streets. It's always that condescending tone. As much as I hated being stuck at some age-old boarding school, I could use some time away from my parents. Before I go on, I should mention how this happened. Simple. I saw a big tough guy pushing around my friend, so I slashed his car tires in front of him to teach him a lesson. But to my parents, that was a rebellious act, so they're sending me to some boarding school as punishment. As we pulled up to Kingsbury's gates, I momentarily forgot how much I didn't want to be there. The medieval castle towers disappearing into the clouds could be mistaken for Hogwarts. I actually felt a string of hope for my future here. Unfortunately, those hopeful thoughts were short-lived. The principal, Mr. Hooper, had already read through my file and made up his mind about me. Rest assured, we have a reputation for our discipline for a reason, and students like Danielle here benefit the most from it. Clearly not the fresh start I had imagined. Mrs. Bell led me down the hall, then stopped at the door to room 237. A girl answered. Hi, Rumi. I'm Cassandra. You can call me Cass. Welcome to Kingsbury. Danny. You'll be under Cassandra's supervision outside school hours. She's a model student who has been here long enough to know that there is no way around our rules. Of course they'd make the teacher's pet babysit me. Awesome. Cass was worse than I thought. She constantly used looking for things as an excuse to touch my stuff. Surely she snooped around when I wasn't here too. So I figured I could have a little fun. I'd give this nosy roommate something to poke her nose into. This looks like an ordinary diary, but on the inside, I wrote about how I'd bring a vodka-filled water bottle to class, put bedbugs in Cass's bed, and sell cheat sheets to other students. You know, fun stuff. I definitely wouldn't do any of that, but gotta give our audience some drama, right? <laughs> and the next day, Cass's behavior confirmed she had really read it. Is everything okay, Cass? What? Everything's fine. Just thought it was time to wash the sheets. Don't mind me. Sure, girl. I believe you. At Kingsbury, there were rules for just about everything. I managed to break half of them within my first two weeks just by existing, it seemed. Worse still, the punishments hardly ever matched the crimes. I once had to reshelve hundreds of books for missing the 8 p.m. curfew just because I was studying in the library. Another time, I had to clean the dining hall for an entire week because my shirt was untucked for a second. Not to mention, Mrs. Bell seemed to have eyes out for everything, everywhere, all at once. What in the world? How was I supposed to know Teen Vogue was considered contraband here? And that was punishable by cleaning every single candle holder in the school church. Could the school be any more constricting? Do they really expect us to entertain ourselves by laughing at the clouds like we're patients in an asylum? Or what? With literally zero fun, no wonder why everyone here always looks like zombies. I hear you're the new school rebel. Danielle, right? I'm Caroline. What do you say we blow this popsicle stand and go have some real fun? No thanks, I've had enough trouble already. It's fine, come on. Hey, you, finish this up, won't you? The audacity of this chick, though. Um, how about no? You can't boss people around like that. Drop that self-righteous act already. No need to pretend you care about dorks. I'm good, and he's not the dork here. Ugh, I thought you were cool. What was that about? That boy thanked me, introduced himself as Ian, and asked what trivial fault I must have made to be stuck with this boring chore. So we chatted and made fun of Kingsbury's rules while I finished up. I felt like I was finally seen after those awful first weeks. Suddenly, things didn't feel so bad anymore. However, Caroline already set out to make my life miserable. This morning, she blocked me in the hallway right before the bell rang, which got me in trouble for being late and running. If she wasn't getting me in trouble, she was trying to humiliate me. And annoyingly, it worked. As much as I wanted to do something about it, I knew that any sort of retaliation would get me in more trouble. The only peaceful moments I had were with Ian. How come I never knew about these cool areas before? This is the entertainment room in the home theater system. And out there is our Olympic-sized swimming pool and the croquet field. Pretty cool, right? But we're almost never allowed to use them. Sometimes I think these are here just to impress parents. This place is unbelievable. All work and no play? Is this a prison? And still, I had a nosy roommate to deal with. 
To keep up the ruse, I wrote some more made-up shenanigans in my dummy diary. Ridiculous rules, Caroline's antics, and how passionately I hated Kingsbury made their way into the diary as well. We were trapped on campus and anything fun was against the rules. It felt like we were here to be reprogrammed into obedient robots our parents wish we were. But at least Ian's cool. The next day, Cass kept trying to strike up a conversation with me. Hey, Rumi. Everything good with you? Define everything. Like, how are you liking Kingsbury? Is anyone giving you trouble or anything? Should I be having problems? No, no, I hope not. I just thought you seemed a little down. As your Romy, I wanted you to know that I'm here for you, if you need a friend. Oh, she must have read my diary again. But honestly, I found her clumsy cover-up quite endearing. Then she tried to change the subject to Caroline, who turned out to be her ex, Rumi. I know she's mean, but she wasn't always that way. She only changed after a big trouble that almost got her kicked out. Wow, what could she have possibly done? Cass said Caroline then soon moved to another room also. I can't help but feel bad for her though. She was actually kind to me. Cass seemed genuinely nice, but I wanted to see if she could be honest. If you're really my friend, then tell me, did you read my diary? You know, but hear me out. Your parents paid me to keep an eye on you and report everything to them. I agreed because I thought I was helping you stay on track. But Cass said she soon realized I wasn't really doing those bad deeds, so she actually told my parents good things only. I promise I've stopped working for them. It was wrong of them to spy on you, but I was in the wrong too. I'm sorry, can you forgive me? I believed her, but it wouldn't hurt to use this newfound friendship for some good. So I asked Cass to propose a fun activity for the upcoming holiday season to lighten up this lifeless place. Teachers, listen to you, and we'll donate the money to a good cause. You love this place, don't you? Help make everyone else love it too. Sounds great! Let's do it! Thanks to Cass, our Christmas market came to life. I'd never seen so many smiling faces at Kingsbury. I even managed to secure some last-minute entertainment. Surprisingly, Ian volunteered to perform, and he's really good. He usually wasn't one to stand out, but that night, things changed. Maybe it was the Christmas lights or the Ed Sheeran effect was making Ian everyone's crush, including mine. Not only did we have a blast, but also raised thousands of dollars to donate to a local hospital. A few days after that, we saw Caroline being flirty towards Ian. Of course Caroline would try to sink her teeth into Ian now that she knew he's hot. Luckily, Ian didn't seem interested. What you looking at? Just you, making an absolute fool of yourself. How dare you! Thanks, Cass, she really wasn't taking the hint. That moment, I knew I'd found my people. The next day, while I was concentrating on my math exam, Caroline suddenly showed me something. I'm so sorry. Let's be friends. She wants to make up? Now? Mrs. Harris, she's copying me. What in the world? This shameless liar! I was preparing for the worst when Mrs. Harris said, What's this, Caroline? Her answers are nothing like yours. Not like Danielle needs to cheat off of you. She then gave me back my sheet and dismissed Caroline's. I could see she was still in shock when she walked out. Incredible! Mrs. Harris totally saw through her act. Mrs. Harris was unlike any other teacher at Kingsbury. She was firm, but kind. With her on my side, Caroline didn't bother me anymore. I felt safe confiding in an adult like her. We eventually became more like friends. You like Ian, don't you? I can tell just by looking. There's a carnival in town tomorrow night. That's your chance to make a move. But Mrs. Harris, curfew. Okay, it didn't sound like a good idea, but I did want to go on a date with Ian, so I texted him and he immediately said yes. Mrs. Harris basically told me to go for it. What could go wrong? I tried to quietly leave, but as I stepped into the hallway, Mrs. Bell's flashlight blinded me and boy was she mad. So mad that she dragged me straight to Mr. Hooper's office. This was the second time I came here, which was a lot sooner than I expected. I knew from the start that you would be a problem, Miss Osborne. You have violated the rules time and time again and display a blatant disregard for authority. Sir, aside from tonight, I never intended to break any rule. I promise I've learned from those mistakes and won't be repeating them. They weren't minor offenses, Miss Osborne. Drinking, distributing cheat sheets, infesting your roommate's bed with bugs. Those were what I wrote in the dummy diary. How? We do not allow such delinquency here. In fact, you should be expelled at this very moment. However, out of respect for your parents, you may leave quietly by your own volition. I tried to explain myself, so he gave me three days to come up with evidence in the end. When I got back, I saw my desk drawer ajar, and Cass was asleep. She wouldn't do this. We're friends. But who else? My phone suddenly rang. 
It's Ian. I didn't want to talk about this over the phone, so I simply explained that someone didn't want me here and promised we'd talk later. I don't want you out either, bestie. Neither do I, Cassie. Not to waste any time, I came up with a plan to sniff out the culprit. This time, I wrote that I was playing a prank on Mrs. Bell. I even set up a silent alarm system with this piece of paper to see if anyone had opened my drawer. The next day, lo and behold, the alarm worked like a charm. They must have taken the bait. Now all there's left to do was... I opened the door to see someone totally unexpected. Now that my plan's set in motion, Ian and I hid behind a wall near Mrs. Bell's office. This is an interesting first date. Romantic, isn't it? We suddenly heard footsteps approaching. I peeked around the corner to see... Mrs. Harris? I instantly felt my blood boiling. The one person who I trusted betrayed me. I was about to confront her when Ian pulled me back and put one hand over my mouth. Mrs. Harris looked around impatiently, then tried to open the door. As the hinges creaked open, Ian played a loud alarm. Startled, Mrs. Harris tripped and fell. Then Mrs. Bell sprinted towards us. <sighs> What's going on? I arrived just in time to catch these two sneaking around your office. They're playing a prank on you. Are you sure? Because that's not what the camera saw. She's lying. She wrote all about it in her diary. I'm here to catch her in the act. Mrs. Harris, how do you know what I write in my personal diary? I was just messing with my roommate. Are you trying to use them against me? Don't believe a word, she says. She's delinquent. Why would she write about sneaking in alcohol if she wasn't thinking of doing it? It's only a matter of time. So you just make up something if nothing happens, Mrs. Harris? Caroline appeared alongside Mr. Hooper. Mrs. Harris's face turned white at their sight. Caroline then said she accidentally overheard Mrs. Harris tell me to go out after curfew, which was shocking because she'd heard the same before. That's how Caroline was disciplined while her boyfriend was expelled. Recognizing the pattern in Mrs. Harris's behavior, she came to me. We decided to work together to stop this once and for all. Do you care to explain yourself? You really believe these rascals? They just want to make me look bad. That's not me in that video, it's deep fake. By that point, many students had gathered around us. They all came forward to share similar stories about Mrs. Harris. She gained their trust and persuaded them to break school rules. When they're on the verge of expulsion, she blackmailed their parents into paying her lots of money to keep them here. At this point, Mrs. Harris had to relent and admitted her wrongdoings. Mr. Hooper summoned me to his office the following day. Miss Osborne, I apologize for misjudging you. I am aghast to learn what Mrs. Harris was doing right under my nose. I may have never known it if it wasn't for yesterday's incident, so thank you. I assure you I'll do whatever it takes to fix the damages she caused. Sir, I don't think Mrs. Harris was the root of the problem. It's Kingsbury's harsh rules. I know you take great pride in them, but rigidity isn't helping. Obedient kids become soft and submissive, while strong-willed ones end up challenging authority. Mrs. Harris took advantage of that. Most students here are exceptional, but their creativity is getting crushed under iron discipline. Mr. Hooper patiently listened to me. In the end, he shook my hand and bid me farewell. A week later, we received an email titled, A Message from the Principal. It contained a video of Mr. Hooper giving a formal apology to the students and families who were victimized by Mrs. Harris, who won't be teaching at any school again. He also acknowledged the problems plaguing our school. Going forward, we will be installing council-based solutions to handle students' problems. Several harsh punishments will be abolished, and mental health services will be available to all. In addition, extracurricular activities will be encouraged. Things have really changed for the better. Liveliness had returned to these beautiful hallways. Caroline stopped acting out and started patching things up with her old friend Cass. Now that the dust has settled, I think I'm in love with Kingsbury. And someone too. We're finally going on our long-awaited date. Storm's coming. Perfect for a race. Let's go, my loyal soldiers. Looks like a big storm, guys. Shall we head home? Scared already? Cowards. I was born and raised in the snow. This is nothing. Then I signaled for Bam and Holly to speed up, but they stopped and barked nonstop instead. Is that pile of snow moving? I hurriedly ran over to check. Oh, MG, it's a boy. No, an angel with blonde hair. My heart was racing. Is this love at first sight? H help me. No matter how much Eldon and Era objected, I insisted on bringing this guy back to my place. I had to take care of him myself. Oh, looks like he'd woken up. Are you okay? Where am I? You're in my house. 
I'm Brenna, by the way. I found- Oh, God. Huh? What's wrong? Something on my face? Um, no. It's just that you're too beautiful. Like a real-life Snow White. Then he said his name's Beavis. He came here to travel, but unfortunately was met by the snowstorm. Yeah, it's gonna snow heavily in the next couple of days, so you should stay here until you recover. After a few days, Beavis got better, so I showed him around, on the sledge. Although Bam and Holly were practically just walking, Beavis still freaked out so much, he huddled up against me. <laughs> Hold on tight, I'm speeding up. We went up a hill, then through a pine forest and arrived at, ta-da, probably the biggest frozen lake he had ever seen. I taught Beavis how to drill a hole in the ice, then he excitedly dropped the fishing line. The following days, I continued taking him sightseeing, and we were basically inseparable. We went to see polar bears kayaking among the icebergs. I taught him how to make instant snow by spraying boiling water into the cold air, and we even watched the spectacular auroras together. Wow, I've never seen such beautiful scenery before. Yeah, and I'd never seen such a beautiful face before. Just like that, we've spent day after another with me here in the Arctic. It's been so much fun, but for some reason, my friends Elden and Era were not having any of it. They seemed to hold grudges against him or something. One time when I was arranging supplies in the root cellar, I heard Beavis's ear-piercing scream. I hurriedly checked and saw a white fox dashing out, followed by giggles outside the window. You're such a chicken, big city boy. It's just an extra large kitty. Then Elden and Era burst into laughter. Ugh, can those two show a little hospitality? At dinner, I cooked him my signature dish as an apology to Beavis for those naughty friends of mine. He was totally cool about it and even told me stories about his friends back at home and about their lives in Florida. Whoa, it sounds so magical. I wish I could lounge around on a beach and soak up the sun while enjoying my coconut drink too. I went to sleep dreaming about the beautiful urban life. Suddenly, a knock on my bedroom door woke me up. I stumbled to answer it and saw Beavis. Hey, Brenna, could you take me to the toilet? It's too dark outside and that fox might come back. <laughs> How cute! He's really good at coming up with excuses to be with me. While waiting for Beavis, I planned out what we're gonna do tomorrow. As he got back from the outhouse, ooh, I couldn't contain my excitement and told him right away. Uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm all better now. Maybe it's time for me to go home. Huh? Why so sudden? I'm sorry, but I really can't take this anymore. No, how can my first love end this fast? It hasn't even started. Brenna, it's so tough for me to live here. I don't want to boil ice every time I need a cup of water or go to the toilet out in the freezing cold. And how tiring that we can only go around on sleds. But even if we had a car, there's literally nowhere to go in this gloomy place. But still, I've endured it all this whole time because I can't leave you. I think I'm in love with you. Beavis, I... How about you going to the city with me so that we could stay together? Oh my, it turned out that we both have feelings for each other, but because of that, he had to suffer in silence. Such a sweet guy. And it's true, he wasn't built for this harsh climate. He didn't belong here. The next morning, I told Elden and Era that I wanted to hang out in Miami for some days. Rena, I don't think it's a good idea. That pansy boy must have coaxed you to do this. Don't buy those sweet words. I tried my best to explain how nice and polite Beavis was, but they wouldn't listen. Girl, he got you all blinded. You've only known him for a few days, not enough to tell what kind of person he is. Can't believe you're just one of those shallow girls. Who are you calling shallow? Yeah, right, I was blinded. Blinded by his kindness. Then I stormed off, leaving Elden and Ira behind. I just worry about you. Yeah, right, worry? Or are you just jealous of me? I came home to a shivering Beavis. He couldn't stand this freezing weather anymore, and I couldn't bear seeing him like this either. So I told Beavis that I would go with him. Look how happy Beavis was, and I too was excited to visit his hometown. It's gonna be fun. It took only less than two days for us to arrange things out, buy the tickets, ask Era to look after Bam and Holly, and we're good to go. After a long flight, we're finally here. It looks like a completely different world in front of my eyes. Crowds of people are rushing left and right. Suddenly, I spotted something. Oh, that looks just like my Holly. What a spoiled husky. At that age, my two buddies were already the best sled dogs in the area. Oopsie. City folks don't seem too friendly, do they? Huh? What else? Why is it moving so fast and non-stop? While I hesitated to take a step, Beavis suddenly carried me up in the air. Don't worry, I got you. Oh boy, he's so sweet. Beavis then got me transformed into a city girl. He took me shopping, then got my hair dyed. I really like my silky black hair, but Beavis said this looked better on me. This too, baby girl. 
This is a tattoo parlor, isn't it? Seeing my confusion, Beef has explained that couples here usually get tattooed on important occasions. And today marks the first day that you walk into my world, so I want it imprinted in my heart. So Beavis and I got matching tattoos that he chose. A weird looking red shape behind the ears. It might not look pretty, but was definitely unique enough to be special for just us two. Once we were done shopping, we went to a luxurious villa. Oh my, is he taking me to his parents? I'm so nervous, not sure how I should behave when Beavis comforted me. They were nice, don't worry, just do as they tell you to. Just then, the main door opened. Everyone turned to look at us full of excitement. This must be the first time Beavis took his girlfriend home then. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. I... Suddenly, a man walked straight over and lifted my chin. Very similar, but... But this, but that. Just look at her birthmark. It's Demi. Thank, Thank goodness. goodness. Our beloved daughter has returned. I was still processing everything when everyone rushed to hug me and bombarded me with questions. I turned to Beavis for help, but where is he? What's going on? I tried to explain that I was Brenna, born in the snowy Arctic. Both my parents had passed away and this was my first time leaving my hometown, but to no avail. My precious daughter, Beavis told us everything. You fell in the woods and had a concussion, so you're having a temporary memory loss. Just get rested for now, okay? Oh, where is Beavis then? I gotta ask him something. Don't worry, your savior will be well rewarded. You'll see him tomorrow. <sighs> everything happened so fast, I'm totally lost. But the most I could do now is to wait until tomorrow. I'm sure Beavis will clear things up. Upon catching sight of Beavis, I immediately unloaded it all onto him. Shush, just listen to me first. Turned out, Beavis worked here for the Atchley's family. He escorted their daughter, Demi, on a trip to the mountains, but she ran away. Mrs. Atchley was utterly furious about this and used his ill mother to blackmail him into finding Demi. That's why he risked going out into the snowstorm where we met. But why me? I have nothing to do with Demi. You and Demi look just like twins. <gasps> When I saw you, I couldn't believe my eyes either. I did what I did because I was worried for my mom. I hope you can forgive me and help us, please. I'll soon find Demi. So, you were only using me? No, I'm truly in love with you, Brenna. I didn't want to be away from you, and you deserve a much better life here, with me. But just wait until I find Demi, then we will run away and live happily together. Poor Beavis. He seriously had the worst luck. If I were him, I guess I would do the same. So I reluctantly lived as Demi. Luckily, her parents thought I lost my memory, which made it not too hard to be her. One day, I received a text from Eldon. I suddenly remembered that I'd been away from home for almost a month. I wonder if Bam and Holly miss me. To say I was not one bit homesick would be a lie. But there's no way I'd speak to Eldon. So I called Era to catch up on things and ask for her help in the search for Demi. It had been a few days already, but neither Ira nor Beavis had heard anything about Demi. Feeling too restless, I went for a walk in the garden. Wait, what's that noise? Alden? See what you got yourself into, idiot. Told ya, I saw right through him. Why are you here? And what are you talking about? Ira already told me. Beavis obviously only sees you as someone else's replacement. He doesn't love you. Let's go home. No, let me go. Stop bothering my girl. Leave me alone, please. You're only making things worse. This place has everything and is much better than a hellhole in the middle of nowhere. Live there all you want. Don't drag me down with you. Eldon immediately let my hand go. He didn't say another word, but gave me a disappointed look. Was that too much? Well, he's the one who kept sticking his nose in others' business. Who is he to control me? After that day, I still saw him lurking around the mansion sometimes. So annoying. Who in their right mind would be out in this scorching heat? Today, Mom, I mean, Mrs. Ashley, suddenly took me shopping. I guess having a family like this isn't too bad, huh? She said tonight I was attending an important dinner party, so I had to put on this tight dress along with a pair of killer heels. They looked pretty good, but I really couldn't breathe. Jeez, how can anyone do this? It's literally harder than walking on thin ice. Ah! Phew, that was close. Thank you, sir. I- Careful, I can't be around to protect you all the time. Alden, why is he still so kind to me? I wanted to say something to him, but Mom already signaled for me to hurry up from afar. I rushed to the car, leaving him there. Thanks to Mom's preparation, the guys there were staring at me without blinking, especially the special guest. Mom told me that I was supposed to be smiley and friendly to Otis, but how was I supposed to do that when he kept rambling all these boring stories? My eyes wandered around, searching for Beavis and an excuse to leave. What are you looking for, sweetie? The most important person is already right in front of you. Ugh! I pushed him away, then ran off. Ah, uh, there 
Beavises. We should get out of this boring place. Oh, Mrs. Ashley's here too? What? That's it? I risk being in danger just to find her and bring her back to you. Don't take me for a fool. I'm only her stepmother, but I can tell that girl isn't Demi. I just let you off since she resembled her quite a bit. You're in no position to demand. But didn't you get Otis all smitten also? Isn't that all you care about anyway? So give me my money. I had to rack my brain to sweet talk that girl into coming here. That means your sickly mother doesn't exist either, does she? Oh, sweet, you've heard it all. So what if that's true? You won't get a dime. I'll expose your scheme. Where are you going, sweetheart? It's bedtime. So my phone was confiscated and I've been locked in this room for three days straight. They wanted me to give in and date Otis, but no way. I tried every possible way to escape, but always ended up getting caught. One morning, I was woken up by dogs barking. Annoyed, I went to the balcony to check and saw Eldon and Bam. Eldon signaled for me to stay calm and flew a paper plane to me, then swiftly left. Let's see. <gasps> Fine then, if that's what he wants. Let's end things here once and for all. I agreed to date Otis like the Ashleys demanded. I even enthusiastically chose my own outfit, did my makeup with a cute hairstyle. Mr. and Mrs. Ashley were very pleased with that. They couldn't hide their excitement and even stood at the gate to welcome Otis when he came to pick me up. As his supercar arrived, Otis, the preppy guy, had just stepped out when Eldon signaled Bam to charge at him and scared him away. Meanwhile, the Ashleys were screaming for security. I was gonna leave in the midst of the chaos, but don't you dare run away. Ugh! Holly jumped out of nowhere and made Beavis fall to his knees. Holly then bit on his pants and dragged him around. Good job, baby! Right then, a car stopped in front of us and a girl stepped out who looked just like me. <gasps> this must be Demi! Who are you? Why do you look exactly like my daughter? What kind of father are you to not recognize your own child? This is precisely why I ran away from home. After that, Demi exposed her stepmother and Beavis's evil plan in my stead. Demi's dad frantically apologized to his daughter and admitted that he'd always been so caught up with work that he overlooked family and his wife's scheme. Get out of my sight at once and don't even think about bringing a dime with you. Then Eldon dragged me into the car and in the driver's seat was Era. Thank you, Ira. Just me? Eldon did most of it. I shyly looked over at Eldon. Thank you, and I'm sorry. It's okay, we're friends after all. I'll take care of you at all costs. Um, uh, anyway, just hope that you've learned your lesson now, Brunna. Not all that glitters is gold. Eldon's right. This beautiful city is glamorous, but I don't belong here. I belong to the wind and snow, to the winterland I call home. Time to go back. The trip to the city was like a fever dream, but let's leave it all behind, cause I'm busy racing with Eldon. As expected, he's always as slow as a turtle. Hi, this is for you. For me? What's the occasion? The day we stop being friends. Brenna, what do you say if we become more than friends? I was walking down the hallway to see the infamous dude standing there, doing his old trick to pick on some shy student. Get that filthy hand off him now! Then I grabbed him and threw him away like a piece of paper. Ah, that's better. Konnichiwa, I'm Yukiko from Japan, the daughter of Fuji, a famous martial art master and the principal of a karate school. As his only child, it's up to me to evolve my warrior spirit and protect the weak from any baka. And this shy girl is Chiharu, the one I saved from a fight with the rival school gang. And ever since then, we became besties. Well, that's also how I earned the nickname Big Boss. I don't really care about it, but it does have some perks. I always had the best reserved seat next to the window, a desk drawer full of snacks, and on top of that, the kid was competing every day to do my homework. However, it also caused me some complications. I seem to have caught the eye of Jun, that rival school's gang leader. He bought me flowers and sent me these cheesy cupcakes every day, but I only gave him a no. Hey, he comes again. If I was your boyfriend, never let you go. Keep you on my arm, girl. You keep go, never be alone. Tomato, tomato, throwing tomatoes. Even when the guard came carrying him away, he was still shouting. You keep go, die, scooter! Gosh, he's such a bug. Later, I came into the classroom and found everyone was going cuckoo over something. How noisy! That's the new student. He's just so handsome. As if you could tell someone's handsome from the back. But when he turned around, my eyes almost bulged from their sockets. It's 
Akira! Back when we were little, I adored Akira from the moment I first saw him. To me, he was even cuter than my favorite Mochi Shiba plushie, so I followed him everywhere and gave him all the candies I had, but he didn't like it that much. Why did you give her my candies? I like Akira. If you take him from me, I'll punch you. Hey, martial arts is not about fighting nonsense. You fierce kid, I hate you. After a while, Akira's family moved away and I'd completely lost contact with him. And now he's back. Our eyes met, but he looked so cold and turned away. He didn't recognize me? Fine, it was so embarrassing facing him again anyway, so I decided to avoid him like the plague since then. And just like that, with his excellent academic ability, Akira soon fell into place as the top student, while I'm a bit different. I may have been a black belt in the karate, but exams were definitely not my thing. Congratulations, you've excelled at coming last. Again. So, Yukiko, I've appointed another student to tutor you. Please don't say his name. Please don't say his name. Please, please, please. Akira, I nearly died on the spot. Can anybody throw me to Mars, please? Man, it's super awkward. I kept looking at the ground when he blurted out, Hi, Yukiko. Long time no see. So, he does remember me? During the lesson, I couldn't focus, and my body was heating up. I kept my mouth shut while he was immersed in his lecture. If there's anything you don't understand, feel free to ask. I plucked up my courage and said, Why didn't you like me when we were kids? You're still acting like before. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you, but your head's stuck in the clouds. Focus. He didn't say he hated me, did he? My heart fluttered again. Guess I'd have to try harder to get his attention then. But things didn't exactly go as planned. During the lessons with Akira, my phone rang constantly with calls and messages. Seemed like my goons were in trouble and they needed my help. I tried my best to ignore it, but finally gave in. I've got something to do. I'll be right back. Hey, those morons. They're always messing around, then leave it to me. Problem solved. Only that, lucky for you, I got there in time. In time to cause more trouble? I'd have eaten them for breakfast without you. Back at school, I saw Akira standing at the gate with a clearly not happy face. Akira, it's not like what you think, I- You find it hard to study, but fighting seems to come naturally to you, huh? Who the freak are you? How dare you talk to my girl like that? Akira, I fight to help people. It's not nonsense. Help? I suppose brainless people only know how to talk with their fists. June immediately lunged at Akira, raising his fists at him. I had to hold him back right away and told him to go. The silence went on for some minutes, but when he was about to leave, I couldn't stand it anymore. Just because I liked you then, you think you have the right to look down on me? What? Hear this. I do like you, but it doesn't mean I will like you forever. I don't care, but I'm sorry if the truth I spoke made you feel that I looked down on you. And you know what? If you can't take my tutoring seriously, then we're done. Fine, go! See if I care. I, the big boss myself, have my own limits and cannot be chasing him all the time. But I couldn't deny that a pit was dropping to the bottom of my stomach. I just want to go home and curl up under cover. Then I arrived at my family's karate academy to see it was all sealed off. And my dad was sitting on the doorstep holding a letter. Dad? What happened? Yukiko, I'm bankrupt. I had no choice but to sell the academy to moneylenders. I've lost everything. No! This academy is our family legacy! My dad's life's work! We couldn't lose it! So I followed the address on the letter, but there I met an unexpected person. June! Turns out, his dad is my dad's creditor. All or nothing, I decided to get straight to the point to him. What do my family have to do to get our martial arts school back? June came over and whispered something in his ear. Then he pondered a while and said, My son kept goofing around. Change him and the martial arts school is back to yours. But how? I want you to get engaged to my son. Are you serious? You think I'm a joke? Then I immediately stood up and left. That was insane! Hey, why are you behaving like that? You're still asking why? It's down to that dude, isn't it? He's just some preppy know-it-all who doesn't even like you. You... you know nothing. He also likes... me, I think. Is that so? Then prove it. Make Akira fall in love with you within two weeks, and I'll convince my father to extend the deadline by three months. Fail, and we get engaged. I'm the one who is always by your side. No way I agree with your stupid deal. Go ahead, refuse. The martial arts school will be permanently closed tomorrow. Wait, I... I... Okay, I'm in. Lucky enough, I had Chiharu, the love guru, to help me cook up the perfect Get Akira scheme. Though she'd been single, like, forever. <laughs> Firstly, I told my gang that Akira'd soon to be my BF, and also their boss, so he deserved a special treat. 
Wherever he went, other students bowed 90 degrees to greet him. They tended to his every need, carried his bag, and were always at his service. But he seemed not so comfortable about this. Ask your goons to stop their nonsense, okay? As long as you agree to my conditions. What? Tutor me again. Oh, and have lunch together. And walk to and from school? I, I can't. Okay then, guys, fine. Secondly, you needed to find out what Akira liked, but he'll refuse to answer my questions for sure. My fake council survey will answer that. Then she handed out the paper to the whole class. My goofy Chiharu did get it done this time. Okay, according to a philosopher, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Akira's most favorite food is beef, so I rummaged through all the local supermarkets to find A5 Wagyu beef and prepared this perfect meal for him. Akira, eat this. Oh, thank you, Cream Puff. How come you know I like beef? How did you get in here? I know you miss me, so I come to visit. Before I could say anything, Akira shook his head and walked off. Okay. The first step is always the hardest. Next, seeing that Akira liked horror movies, I lied to him that Chiharu stood me up, so I had an extra ticket. It's insidious. How could he refuse? But as soon as we sat down, a familiar face caught my attention. June? Stop messing with me, you child! Eh? I'm a horror fan, just like you. We're sure a match made in heaven. I tried to ignore him and focus on my plan. This was the third time I watched this, so I knew exactly when there'd be a jump scare. It's time. I pasted a whining look on my face and was about to lean on Akira when June suddenly screamed his lungs out and jumped at me. It was not until he fell asleep that we had a bit of privacy, but from then till we left, Akira didn't speak a word and even asked to leave early. That's not okay. If things kept going this way, the whole plan would definitely fail, and it means I'd have to get engaged to June. No! The next day, I wasn't in the mood for dealing with my friends, so I lingered back in the classroom and read through Akira's notes. Oh, what's this? So, he does care about me. I can see one ray of hope. Akira, I want to improve my studies. Help me? Oh, okay. I was waiting outside for Akira to get us some bubble teas before we started, when suddenly this thief darted out and snatched this old lady's bag. I dove in there to help, but he knocked me to the ground and ran away. Here you go. You're already fighting again? Don't you have anything better to do? I'm not fi- Forget it anyway. This brave young lady helped me. W what? Say no more. I'm a bad person no matter what. Then I stormed off without looking back. I was so stupid to catch feels with that insensitive one. Then my knee suddenly collapsed. Right then, a hand reached out and gently wrapped a bandage around my knee. Leave me alone. Get on my back. Shut up. Come on. I couldn't help but smile through my frown, and my heart did a cartwheel. I clambered onto his back and looped my arms around his neck. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you- It's okay. Are you dumb? An injured leg is not enough? It's nothing. And- you don't have to carry me like this. Am I heavy? What? <laughs> if I say yes, will you jump off? No way. After that day, Akira changed towards me. He joined me for lunch and even gave me a cute cupcake and agreed to go to Cat Cafe with me, even though he's allergic. And the classes went so smoothly. He was sweet like a lollipop and answered to all my silly questions. One time, I even accidentally saw him putting a lot of bandages in my locker. Aww. Winning the bet didn't seem so impossible then, but suddenly a girl approached him. It was Amaya, the school's popular girl. They chewed the fat, then she leaned closer and whispered something to him. His face suddenly turned cold, then he walked away. I was about to go after him when my phone beeped. Can't tutor you today, I have a play audition. So, turns out Akira and Amaya were both in this play. Fine, if Akira's Romeo, then I must be Juliet. I made it to the final round with my big boss energy, which meant I got to act out a scene with Akira to see who got the female lead between me and Amaya. Oh dear, look at them, being all clingy for what? That snake was all over my poor Akira like a rash. Ugh, if Chiharu hadn't constantly held me back, I'd have jumped there and given her a piece of my mind. And now it's time for me to shine. But why is Akira's face darkened? It's okay, maybe he's trying to be professional? My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love. My love, as adoring as, as a puppy dog's nose. Um, yes, so I may have forgotten the words, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> he may pick me for my quick thinking and... I choose Amaya, miss. Hey, why did you pick her? You shouldn't ask me, ask yourself instead. Then he left with Amaya without glancing at me. But today is the end of the two week deadline. I thought you'd have some feelings for me too. It was pouring rain. I trudged home, all collapsed, tears and rain falling down all over my face. 
It was all over. The bed I play, the boy I love. I should have known better that it was me onto a loser right from the outset. Through my teary eyes, I saw June running towards me. Yukiko, what's wrong? Tell me. I... I lost. What? The bet. Between us. I lost it. I was wrong. About everything. Who cares about the bet? You might get a cold, you know. Get inside. But why you're here? I don't care if you think it's too late. I'm telling you anyway. I know that I'm not perfect like him. I do say the wrong thing. I forget all the time, but I... I can protect and will never hurt you. So will you... marry me? My head was spinning, and in a moment of weakness, I said yes. At least I can save my dad's school and be with the right person who truly cares about me, instead of chasing some jerk who thought so low of me. I confided in Chiharu and my family about this, but kept it a secret from everyone else. <sighs> my father didn't approve it at first, but seeing my determination, he reluctantly agreed. It was our fitting day. I was with June discussing our wedding, but he seemed distracted and kept checking his phone. Then he said he had to take a call and hurried out. Sensing something was up, I followed him. Huh? Why is he talking to Amaya? You have to thank me for your new fiancé. I told Akira about your bet. Um, excellent job, as promised. It's not about the money. It's about making Akira mine. I don't get why both you and my beautiful Yukiko like that dude so much. Anyway, Yukiko's waiting for me. Gotta go. I couldn't believe what was in front of me. What the heck are you doing here? So it's you who made up everything the whole time? No, Yukiko. Let me explain. I trusted you, June. But look what you've done. You know what? You win. Do your worst. I don't care anymore. Then I ran home as fast as I could. Why do boys all fool me around like that? Right when I felt more disheartened than ever, I met the one that I didn't want to see the most. What was Akira doing here? Yukiko, let's talk. We have nothing to talk about. Chiharu told me what you're doing. You can't marry June. You liked me, so you mustn't fall for another one that easily. What? So you're the commander of my feelings now? Aren't you with Amaya? I'm not, and I never did. Listen, I was so angry to find out I was just part of your bet with June, so I ignored you. But then Chiharu told me why you did it and made me understand. So what? Anyway, you never liked me. I'm not gentle and too fierce, as you said before. Don't try to pity me. I don't. It's that I do like you. At first, I thought you were the type of person who'd use violence to solve any problem. But the more I got to know you, the more I learned about your pure heart. I shouldn't have judged you so quickly. I'm sorry. What just happened? I might be dreaming? But no, Akira, my seven-year crush, just confessed his love with me. So, Akira and I got together. June was furious about it, but he kept his word, and now my dad has three months to pay off his debt. I'm helping him out by teaching karate classes to earn money, something I really enjoy. Everything was great, too great, until... Yukiko, I gotta tell you something. I... I have to go abroad to study. I'll leave. Tomorrow. What? I don't understand. Why so sudden? I prepared for it months ago, but I couldn't tell you. I didn't want to make you sad. Will you... wait for me? Of course not. I may get bored and start liking another by that time. It's time. I stood still watching the train pass by, until I noticed Akira's melancholy smile. I liked you seven years ago, and now I still do. So of course I can wait for you. Come back soon, Akira. Sitting at my usual spot in the common room during break time. Coding, of course. Eyes glued to my MacBook Pro when suddenly, Evelyn, my best friend, barged in and ran straight over to a group of girls. Here she goes again. Guys, guys, I've got big news. You all know Helen, right? The cheerleader? Okay, she has a huge crush on Dean, so she went to the locker and it said yes. Now guess what? I just saw them in the hallway, kissing! Ha! Huh? These gossip vultures will believe anything. Confused? Let me wrap it up for you. They were talking about this mysterious locker, situated in the school's back alley. The creepy part was, it could actually speak and foretell your future love partner. For it to work, you had to visit the locker between 6 and 7 p.m. Tap on it exactly three times and say the spell. Roses are red, Violets are blue, in a world of love, just we two. Then, ask it if you and your crush are compatible. If the locker said yes, then congratulations. But if no, then too bad. 
This proves it. The locker must have some sort of prophecy power. Of course, duh, you know why? Because it's possessed by a lovelorn spirit. <laughs> oh boy, if only these naive kids knew the truth. The mystical locker that they so worshipped was actually a product of advanced IT, of which the mastermind was moi. Didn't see that coming, did you? I'm Karina, by the way. But people like to call me Robot Girl because I'm a super proud tech genius. But kids my age didn't appreciate my talents as they only seem to care about love. Especially Alicia over there. She despised IT and presumed that anyone into it was a stone-cold machine who'd never ever had a relationship. <laughs> so, being the tech was that I am, I had to come up with a brilliant plan to prove her wrong. I spent every bit of spare time I had coding. I hacked into the school system to collect students' infos, such as their star signs, blood type, hobbies, and career orientation. Then, I used this as a database to create a love compatibility calculator. And just like that, my first brainchild was born. Easy peasy! Using it was simple. All I had to do was insert the two names and it'd show me a yes or a no. Knowing how much my peers buy into the whole spiritual stuff, I devised my locker plan. I found this rusty locker at the dead-end alley behind our school, super glued a walkie-talkie inside, locked it well. Then, with the other walkie-talkie in hand, I stayed in the school equipment room, which is convenient enough to be on the other side of the wall. To top it up a notch, I even used a voice changer app to get a perfect ghostly haunted tone. Then, I anonymously spread rumors about the locker's magical powers onto the school's blog. My trick quickly took off, and since launch day, 15 couples have been successfully matched. Can you imagine? True love? Oh, please. It all came down to some simple algorithms. That's all. But, one more thing. I hadn't exactly told Evelyn about this. Yeah, I love her, but she's not the best at keeping secrets. To be exact, she's a walking speaker who couldn't help but blab any gossip she'd heard to the entire school. Anyway, I needed to test if the logger actually worked first. Then I'd tell her, maybe when I reach 20 successful couples. Luckily for me, keeping this one secret from her turned out to be easy, as her attention was all on her crush, Jace, the school's hot boy. In her eyes, Jace was like an angel or something. It seems like I'm the only one who didn't get the gooey eyes memo. One evening, I was taking my locker shift when I heard a familiar voice. Evelyn's! Oh boy, I could already guess she wanted to ask about her and Jace. The algorithm said yes, and I could hear Evelyn screaming ecstatically at the announcement. <sighs> Fine, if she's happy, I'm happy. But it didn't last long, as an hour later, just as I was about to leave, more footsteps came towards the locker and I heard a knock on it. Roses are red, violets are blue. Hold on, Jace? What was he doing out here? Can I become a couple with Karina? What? No way! Had something hit his head? I immediately said no. No calculator needed for that. He stayed silent at first, but then asked again if I'd be his girlfriend. The answer was still no. He asked the locker again and again, but no, no, no. Jeez, what's with this guy? The next day at school, I noticed Evelyn's wearing her lucky lilac dress. Oh no, was she going to confess to Jace? I had to stop this. Hey, I have an emergency thingy. You need to come with me. Karina, what are you doing? But it was too late as Jace was approaching us. Hey, what are you playing? Tug of war? <laughs> oh, I think you messed up your hair. Here, let me. Jeez, he wasn't necessarily close. And the worst part was that Evelyn just witnessed the whole thing. Right at that moment, the bell rang and she left for class. Jace, this idiot! The locker said no already, and there he went, messing it all up. 
now, I had to wait till the end of class to explain things to Evelyn. But things weren't that easy, as every time I tried to approach her, she gave me this flustered look then hurried away. One time, I managed to reach her, but then, yep, you guessed it, Shameless Jace showed up and ruined the conversation. Gosh, this leech wouldn't quit bothering me. In math class, he asked the teacher to let him change from Evelyn's group to mine, cause he suddenly wanted me to tutor him. The worst part was, the more I tried to ignore him, the more interested in me he seemed to get. Until one day, as I was running away from him, I bumped into someone. It was the school's head boy, Killian. Oh man, I was sure I was in trouble, but... Can you see you're bothering her? Quit it already. Did Killian just defend me? But, uh-oh, that sure made Jace mad. It's none of your business. Excuse me, this is a library, not a theater club. Keep quiet or out. Phew, thank god I got out of there. But, come to think of it, that was a strange thing for the normally stern-faced Killian to do. Hmm, whatever. I don't have time to think about this right now. So far, the locker had predicted 19 couples successfully. I just needed one more match then I could proudly make my invention public. And voila! My app would change the whole world's dating scene. Here it is, my 20th client. Wait, isn't that... Killian? And guess who he's asking about? Yeah, me! Maybe everyone was right about the robot girl nickname. Cause how could I be so clueless all this time about Jace and now Killian? I inserted the data and the result was a no. But hang on, what if I did it Killian? Would that make Jace give up and stop bothering me? And Evelyn wouldn't keep her distance from me anymore. It settled. The locker pronounced yes. Monday morning. I was in the study hall, working on the math group project with Chase, when a note was passed to me. Hey, I know this is a bit sudden, but would you like to go out with me? Saturday, 3 p.m., Killian. I took a peek at him and saw him smiling for the first time ever. Okay, I was about to write my answer when Jay snatched the note, read it, then stared straight at Killian. You, me, outside. What was he gonna do now? I sneakily followed them to the hallway, but Evelyn appeared right behind me and signaled me to shush. That was when I heard Jace asking what was going on between me and Killian. Nothing really. Only the infamous love locker foretold Karina and I would be together. Jace was too stunned to speak as he turned purple with rage. So there's nothing going on between you and Jace? Of course not! I've been trying to tell you that this whole time! You've heard everything? Sorry, I didn't mean to. So, what do you think about the date? Um, sure, I'd love to. I could see Jace's boiled over from behind, but what could he do other than bear his grudge and storm off? <laughs> Problem solved! Saturday arrived and Killian picked me up for our date. He even asked for my parents' approval, then opened the car door for me like a true gentleman. To be honest, I was kind of nervous, but he was so good at comforting me. He then took me to the super cool ice cream drive through and coincidentally, we picked the same flavor, butter pecan. <laughs> Before I noticed, I'd felt so comfortable around him already. And you know what the best part was? Our last stop was a planetarium. We sat side by side beneath the glistening star-filled sky. Whoa. This date was much more than I expected. I got to see this whole new side of him, one that is so warm and caring. Being with him made me feel good. Maybe the algorithms weren't quite accurate, right? It did say Killian and I would never be a couple, but what I was feeling then proved otherwise. I was still lost in thoughts when my alarm suddenly went off. 5.15 already? Right, I gotta get to the locker and change the walkie-talkie's battery. So I quickly said goodbye to Killian, then ran to the alley. As I was opening the locker to get the walkie-talkie out, 
Karina? Are you opening the locker? How? Unless you're... Oh. I don't know how, but you sure tricked the entire school. I froze on the spot not knowing what to do. There's no need to freak out. I'm not gonna tell a soul. That is, as long as you become a girlfriend. Why are you so obsessed with me? You can have anyone else you want. Why me? Cause you're different, babe. You're interesting and somehow aren't easily swayed by me. Which makes you a challenge. Ugh. This douchebag made me want to vomit. He could expose me all he wants, but I'd never ever go near him again. I shoved past him to leave, but suddenly, he grabbed my hand and tried to force me into his embrace. Get off of me, you psycho! I never meant for it to turn out like this. I just wanted to prove that data was the driving force of compatibility. But maybe I'd been wrong after all. <sighs> I decided it was time to confess all to Evelyn before Jace told her first. Only the next morning, when I arrived to pick her up as usual, her mom told me she'd already left. Hmm, was there something I didn't know about? I turned on my phone notifications, and that's when I saw it. Alicia had posted the picture of Jace grabbing me, but the angle made it look like, in Alicia's words, we were kissing. Huh? So that's why Evelyn didn't want to see me. And what would Killian think of this? I arrived at school just as Killian stepped out of his car. I rushed toward him and when our eyes met, I could see he was hurt. Then he just turned and walked away. Without thinking, I caught up with him and I poured my heart out telling him I was the one behind the locker. How I got involved with Jace because of Evelyn and how I lied to him when he went to the locker. But that was also how I realized I had feelings for someone. For you. Excuse me? You're the one behind the love locker? No way. Gosh, I'm so glad I got all my secrets out. In that case, we have a big problem. Evelyn then walked me along the corridor, and what I saw was pure chaos. People were crying, arguing, and even fighting, all because of the locker. One couple was having a tearful breakup because the locker claimed they weren't meant to be. In the other corner, two girls were fighting because the locker matched them to the same guy. A boy was breaking stuff out of anger since the locker didn't match him with his crush. The entire lobby echoed the words, love locker. Gosh, how'd I been so oblivious to this before? I'd been so caught up with my own problems, I'd neglected the consequences of the locker I'd created. This was wrong, so wrong. I had to shut the locker down right now. I rummaged through my bag to find my MacBook, but this was my baby, my first brainchild. I... No, I must do this. <sighs> yeah, that was the right thing to do. Technology shouldn't be used to predict one's feelings. I've learned the hard way not to mess with anyone's relationship ever again. And that love is never ever simple. You don't need a mysterious object of the spiritual world to tell you who to date. You just gotta experience it. Well, it's been three months since I shut down the infamous love locker. Now, everything is finally back to normal. And guess what? I've got a boyfriend. Yup, Kilian and I just went official last week. Evelyn doesn't like Jace anymore. She vowed not to run after some good-looking pretentious jerk ever again. Instead, she's just gonna wait for the right guy to come along. About the love locker, when people realized it didn't work anymore, the speculations became rife. My personal favorite is that the spirit had found peace and left. But still, every now and then, I hear someone gossip about the haunted love locker that once turned the whole school upside down. And I can help but feel all goose pimply. Oof. How is it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? 
The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. Here comes my chance! Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his maids just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is! Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting, and coldly said, Work off your debt? Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out, he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of 10 feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and... His every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea, but he missed it and tea spilled all over him. Clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold, whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Wanna come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there, and werewolves too. His horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind, Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So, ta-da, I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but where is he? Should I? I opened the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him, still he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly his eyes opened. Hey, the 10 foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought, if you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new maid again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you. Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. 
See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly... He's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but... Ouch! I tripped over a rock! Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then, let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops, awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. I wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph, please don't do it. Ah, my arm. Realizing that he just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay, it's okay, calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with this strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk. And when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster, just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we noticed a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away. So the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. 
But Jocasta, with you by my side now, anything feels possible. Hey, I'm Sage, but you can call me Witch. That's what all the townspeople call me anyway. My folks run a funeral home called Black Rose, and some superstitious people consider this a bad omen. By some, I mean the entire town. Everything about us is spooky and weird. Wanna see our house? It kinda has that monster house vibe, and looks like a fort in the middle of this dollhouse neighborhood. I did try making friends with the other kids, but it never worked out. Ah, don't eat the cookies, they're poisoned. Despite all that, mom and dad found their work meaningful and put a lot of effort into it. Well, maybe a little too much? I guess the reason why they're so emotional is because they know what it feels like to lose someone dear to them. My little sister Leah's missing, and it's all my fault. We'd searched for her everywhere for five years, but still, no news. It was a terrible time for my family, but instead of showing us support, the neighbors spread absurd rumors about Leah's disappearance. Some said the devil took her, while others said we sacrificed her during a satanic ritual. These heartless people were never going to change their minds about us, so I decided to just go along with it. This is why no one dares to bother me, as they don't want to be cursed- Ouch! Oh, sorry miss, we're just trying to catch that bird! Please don't curse us! Jesus, that poor little thing! If you hurt an innocent creature again, I'll turn you into one and see how you like having stones shot at you. Blood drained immediately from their faces as they screamed and bolted. I carefully took the bird out of the bush, then brought it to my forest house. This is my secret hideout deep in the forest. I have my own garden where I plant herbs to heal injured animals. This isn't a wild bird. It even has a name. Must be someone's pet. Okay, Sky. so you like to sneak out, huh? The world out there is dangerous. I should bring you home. I followed the address on Skye's tag and took her there. Guess her owner wouldn't be happy if they thought a witch had cursed her, so it's better not to show myself. No one wants anything to do with a witch. But no matter how annoyed or scared they acted, I just don't care. Having the place to myself has its perks. But then out of the blue, a guy slumped on the chair opposite me. How dare he? I could feel his eyes peeking at me, another idiot wanting to test his courage. Hey, Sage, right? We're in the same English literature class. But in case you didn't know, I'm Mark. Why should I know your name? Oh, I... I just wanted to... If you don't want to get diarrhea, sleep paralysis, or skin rashes, don't ever talk to me. Then I turned around to leave, but tripped over something and fell forward. You alright? This is crazy. Who asked him to do that? Then I came home to find an angry crowd in front of my house. Those eerie sounds are keeping us awake at night. What kind of dark magic are you practicing? Your black sorcery made my curling iron overheat and burn my hair. Must be some demonic influence messing around here. Turns out, strange things were happening to every house in the neighborhood. So these superstitious people blamed everything on my family and even wanted to kick us out. We can't move. We have to wait here for Leah. She's with the devil now. She's obviously not coming back. So go away. Never talk about my sister like that again. Get out of here! Coincidentally, there was a loud rumble of thunder right at that moment. Horrified, they started pointing and calling me a witch. Go home, everyone, for your own safety. I'll take it from here. This man is Mr. Thompson, the town's mayor. He came with an offer to help our family move away in peace. Believe me, it's best for everyone. If and when your daughter comes back, you'll be informed right away. After he left, my parents seemed to be thinking about moving away for real. What's gotten into them? We didn't do anything wrong. Why do we have to leave? I'm not going anywhere. My parents might be weak, but I'm not. I'll wait for my sister here. She promised me she'd help me care for those poor creatures. She will be back. Achoo! What was that? It sounds like a guy's sneeze? Who's there? Show yourself. Ugh, you idiot. Come out alone. Both of you. Now. Those two look familiar. Right, they're Meg and Nick, the infamous best friend duo in my school. It turns out, they were curious about the strange phenomena happening at Meg's house too. They wanted to see if I was really using witchcraft to cause all that. We didn't expect to see you healing animals here. Why do you let people think you're a witch? They can call me a witch, an alien, or whatever. I don't care, as long as they leave me be. I hate it when people annoy me, which is what you two are doing now. Quit following me and never come here again but they didn't leave. 
Instead, Meg told me about a black rose that always appeared at the scene. Of course, it reminds the townsfolk of my family. Nick thought that made no sense. I mean, if it really was us, why would we make it that obvious? Hmm, someone's clearly trying to frame us. That's it. If I found that person, my family could live here in peace again. We'll investigate together. We can catch the bad guy and be heroes, like a detective squad. Sounds like you've been watching too much Scooby-Doo. And why aren't you guys scared of me? Actually, I'd make a great Daphne. And come on, we just saw you feeding the cats. Even if you are a witch, then you must be a kind one. The next day, I was going downstairs when I heard some chattering noise. Are those angry townsfolk back? I was about to scare them away, but I saw my parents warmly welcoming Meg and Nick? This is the first time I'd had friends come over, so my parents were overreacting. I hurriedly pulled my so-called friends out of the house. I guess disturbing me has become a habit to you, huh? We didn't know how else to contact you. Anyway, we'd like to introduce you to an IT expert. He's agreed to help us. Then suddenly, a guy standing behind the black rose bush appeared and said hi to me. Isn't that the guy from the library? This is Mark, the newest member of our squad. Good to see you again. I hope you'll remember my name this time. So this Mark guy was really serious about this. He's now telling Nick how he could get data from all of the cameras in the neighborhood, which sounded like some kind of alien language to me. Look, our tech genius found something. Mark is awesome, right Sage? Um, I guess? Um, someone hacked into these houses' networks and was causing their electrical appliances to go haywire. And every night at 11 o'clock sharp, the camera would be disconnected. Not for long, just enough for someone to place a black rose at the scene unnoticed. Can you track down that hacker's IP address? Yes, and also their coordinates. That's Clara's house? Wait, Clara? The drama queen who always plays up everything about me? Does she hate me that much to target my whole family? We reached out to Clara to talk privately, but she flat out denied everything. What is wrong with you? Did this witch hypnotize you into becoming her slave? Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> we have proof. You can't get away with this. Are you threatening me? This is illegal. I will tell my father about this. You think you're a big deal just because your father is the mayor? Big enough for you to watch out. She's the mayor's daughter? What's with that smug attitude? Everyone in this school remembers how she embarrassed herself last year after Mark rejected her. You may not know this, but Mark is the most popular guy among the girls in our school. It, um, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in those girls. You don't have to explain yourself to me. I don't even care. The atmosphere suddenly became weirdly awkward. Well, now the only way is to stalk Clara and catch her red-handed. But we've been sitting here for an hour and nothing's happened. This snooping scheme is so silly. I was about to leave when Mark stopped me. Someone was coming out of Clara's house. Gotcha. Still trying to deny it now, Clara? Mark took off his mask, but who is this man? He suddenly flung out, then attacked Mark and ran off. We were about to chase him when Mark cried out in pain. Meg and Nick told me to take Mark home while they chased after the guy. I brought him home. Hmm, this house looks so familiar. Oh, this was the owner's house of Sky the bird I'd saved. Mark explained he'd seen me bring Sky back and was impressed with the note I'd left on how to take care of its wound. I knew everyone had been wrong about you, so I wanted to thank you and be your friend. I'm not someone who could make friends. Then I quickly left. The next day, Mark helped us arrange a meeting with Clara at the cafe where he worked. When Clara heard about the man coming out of her house last night, she seemed shaken and said he was probably one of her dad's staff. However, when Meg asked her for her help, Clara refused. We hit a dead end again, but Mark said he already had a solution. Before he could tell us, the cafe owner appeared and told me that spooky stuff was happening and asked me to leave. The holy statue, the town's symbol, was broken, and they found another black rose at the scene. Meg and Nick immediately jumped to my defense, but he didn't listen. He also forbade Mark from hanging out with me or else he'd fire him. I'll leave now. See, I'm not good at making friends. I only bring them trouble. I dashed away so no one could see me cry. However, suddenly, someone's hand grabbed mine, then pulled me onto the bus just as it arrived at its stop. Mark? What are you doing? He'll fire you! I quit. That kind of boss doesn't get to fire me. It's all my fault. Don't worry. I have a ton of different jobs. Waiter, dog walker, even babysitter. Anything that makes money. What's the money for? This bus will take you to the answer. We got off at the last stop. An orphanage. So Mark was donating the money he earned to these orphans. Promise me you'll show them your true kind side. 
At first, I wasn't sure if I could, but then I gradually opened up to these sweet kids. Suddenly, I saw a familiar figure watching other children having fun from afar. Is that... Leah? My sister? Turns out, five years ago, a lost kid was found wandering by the bus stop. She was so scared that she couldn't remember anything about her family. She only said a few separate words like funeral or dead people, so the nuns thought her parents had passed away and took her in. During her time here, she couldn't blend in with other kids. Seeing how Leah pushes others away, I saw myself in her. She shouldn't live her life the same way I do. I then called my parents and they came to pick us up right away. Oh boy, it surely was the tearful reunion of the century. Thank you so much. We only found Leah thanks to you. I'm glad to help, but that's not all. I've got something else to show you. As it turned out, Mark bugged Clara's phone at the cafe. It recorded a call she had with her father, exposing him as the culprit behind the town's mishaps. It appears Mr. Mayor wanted to build a shopping mall, but he needed to clear up some space for it. Using my family's bad rap, he played spooky tricks on the townspeople to scare them into selling their homes for cheap. When Clara found out the truth, she begged her father to stop, but he refused to. Meg and Nick posted the recording on the internet, causing outrage among our town. The cops arrested him, and my family's name was cleared. All our neighbors apologized to my family for letting their superstitions blindside them. My parents were obviously touched, so they forgave them all, and threw a party. So my family was reunited. Not only did I find my sister, but also three good friends. Well, maybe two good friends, and one more than just a friend. Hey there, animated story show viewers. I'm Crystal, a model and influencer, and I'm here for the Trend Like This Influencer Awards. Why don't you come on in and get ready with me? I know what you're thinking. I have a unique look. You see, I have vitiligo, a condition that causes pale patches to develop on my skin. It's definitely different, but I don't really see it as a disadvantage, but rather one of my biggest perks in life. Since I was a kid, people have always gawped at me in the street. But luckily, my mom and big sis have always been there to support me. Honey, they're only looking at you that way because you're beautifully different. Yeah, Crystal, never doubt yourself. You're one of a kind. Thanks to them, I've grown to adore the way I look. Then one time, while we were walking in the park, this eccentric-looking man approached me. Oh my word, your skin! It's a masterpiece! Turns out, he was Bo Ivanov, the world-renowned photographer. He begged me to model for him, and with the encouragement of my mom and sis, I agreed, and my photos became a viral hit. That's when my interest in modeling sparked. I joined this awesome modeling agent and got to learn all poses for photo shoots, wear these gorgeous outfits, and best of all, have makeup done to complement my vitiligo, not to hide it. Ever since then, I've worked my butt off, fully committed to my work. That's how I became the face of multiple fashion brands and built up my influence empire. I wanted to pave the way for people like me to love themselves and celebrate our own uniqueness. Cause look at me, my career, my life could come to this point today, all thanks to my skin. And I wouldn't change it for the world. But then this morning came, I woke up to see, yeah, my vitiligo patches, they were gone. This can't be happening. I still have tons of fashion shows and events booked for the rest of the year. Without my patches, will they all cancel on me? Panicked, I called my manager, Alex, and she immediately rushed into my apartment. This shouldn't have happened. The project with Red Rush is next week. I know that. What can I do? Go see a dermatologist? No, Crystal. You can't breathe a word about this to anyone. You don't want to ruin your career, do you? Well, no, but I can't hide inside forever. No, you can't. But you can fake your patches. Just use makeup. Draw some on. What? You mean I should lie to everyone? Your choice. It's either that or kiss goodbye to your career. This is wrong, I know, but I've worked so hard for this. I couldn't just give up now. I guess the foundation would have to make do. I went back to my daily modeling life, and luckily no one seemed to suspect anything. But I was so on edge and constantly checking my makeup. Crystal, have you heard? The brand Raris is looking for models with unconventional features for its newest fashion collection. You're the perfect fit! OMG! Everyone who's anyone in fashion knew of the Raris' creator, Mr. Finnegan. If I become his muse, that's my step into high fashion world! I can't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity! I got my focus straight, fearlessly walking into the building, when suddenly my heel got stuck. 
I tumbled backward, and out of nowhere, these strong arms wrapped around me, and I landed straight into their warm embrace. For a moment there, I could feel their divine scent overpowering me. Hmm, Dior Sauvage, isn't it? You don't change much, do you? Still clumsy even though you're now a superstar. Hold up, this voice. It's Sam, my high school ride or die! My, my, puberty has hit him hard, huh? Samuel knelt down and gently put the heel back on my foot. Yep, my heart was definitely flipping out of my chest. You're going in for the casting, right? Oh, um, yes, but how do you know? I'm one of the judges. I gotta go now, break a leg, uh, but not literally. Wow, Samuel's made a name for himself already. Impressive. Wait, Crystal, you're here for work. And now time to shine. I strutted my way along the catwalk, doing my signature twist-turn pose at the end of it. As expected, all the judges were mesmerized. This job was in the bag. Just then, everyone went ooh and aw at the girl next in line. It's Amanda! She's known as the super rookie, who challenges the modeling world's standards. Ironically, that title once belonged to me, but that's how this industry works. You can easily be dismissed if not careful. We got the results right after the casting. As expected, I was in for the show. Hooray! Hey, Crystal, right? Amanda, huge fan of yours. Say, can a pro like you give this rookie any advice while we train together? You do know this is a competition, right? That means no help. Then I shimmied off. Day one of the training and I already messed up. I had to disguise myself to sneak out and buy a new one. Crisis averted, but this did make me 30 minutes late. You're the professional. Act like one so us amateur can look up to. A veteran in modeling, or so they say. Those chicks wouldn't miss the chance to dethrone me, especially her. Welcome, everyone. May I introduce you to our fall 2023 haute couture collection. It is inspired by the elegant art of ballet. So besides your usual training, you'll have a chance to learn some of the moves to capture its true essence. Then I'll pick my star, my vedette. Ballet? I hadn't done that since the accident! Little six-year-old me was having a ballet performance and had to do this crazy spinning technique. But somehow, I ended up twirling like a humming top, then face-planted right on the stage. I never forget the audience's mocking waves of laughter. No, get yourself together, Crystal. Whatever the challenge is, I'll succeed and rock the vedette position. The first lesson was catwalk. Easy peasy, no one came close to matching me. Good posture, excellent posing. Well done, Crystal. Aw, he's so sweet. Can we just take a break to admire this piece of art? Come on, why are you so shy today, Crystal? Your patches are superb. <laughs> Except they're just the magic of makeup. But the nightmare had only just begun. Jeez, these clothes were way too tight. They got me melting like the witch from The Wizard of Oz. Gotta go touch up. Then during another session, I couldn't keep my balance and was wobblier than a jellyfish. Meanwhile, Amanda effortlessly executed all those moves. A few days later, Mr. Finnegan organized a photo shoot, which we had to pose like a ballerina on this revolving platform. The past trauma immediately rushed back into my head. I stepped onto the platform shaking like a leaf. Only with Samuel holding my hands could I imagine to do the simplest pose. At least it's over now. My, my, our pro seems a little rusty, doesn't she? Just step back and let one of us younger girls take care of this. Right, Amanda? Go practice, Xena. Amanda stepped up to the platform. Her body started moving like a real swan. Gorgeous, Amanda. You're as graceful as the ballerina in the musical box. That's it. I think we got the shot. Well done. The whole set erupted in applause, and Amanda was the center of attention. Looks like you could learn a thing or two from your junior. Look, I may not be the best ballerina out there, but I'll show them where 1,000% efforts get me in life. So I stayed later after the training to practice more, starting with stretching. Ouch, not as easy as it looked. Okay, let's try again. Just have to raise my leg and... Whoa, whoa! Okay, this time it has to work. And now the hardest part, sur le point. Uh-oh. Just then, Samuel appeared, trying to catch me, but we both ended up stumbling on the floor. Don't try too hard. You may hurt yourself. It's just, the vedette means a lot to me. I know you can do it. You've been such a positive influence, and I know that energy can get you what you want. No, my patches. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's okay. I crossed the line. I'll just leave now. Don't, please. If you only knew the truth, you wouldn't think so highly of me. Hey, what's wrong? You can talk to me, you know. 
Just then, the lights brightened around us. What are you two doing here at this hour? Samuel looked startled and immediately kept his distance from me. Nothing. I saw Crystal practicing. Thought I could give her some advice. That's not fair. I need some too. What do you think of my releve? They started laughing together like a married couple. Since when did they get so close? After a few days of intense practice, I may not be a ballet master yet, but I did feel more confident about facing the final challenge, which decided who would be the vedette. Look at this gorgeous couture design! I would make a perfect black swan. I tried the dress on, but accidentally smudged the foundation and got it all over the dress! Oh no! I immediately rushed to the bathroom trying to wash the stain off! Stupid foundation! Super stay my butt! The door suddenly snapped open and in stepped... Amanda! You... your vitiligo patches? They're coming off? And what are you doing with the dress? I tried to hide it, but she already snatched it away from me. Is it foundation stain? Did you bake your vitiligo? No, no, I was diagnosed with vitiligo for real, I, I swear. I told her the truth, thought she was gonna use it against me, but to my surprise, she looked heartbroken. I decided to pursue modeling because I felt inspired by you, but now you're telling me it's all a scam? How could you? Amanda, wait, please, I... I thought you were against me. Does it matter anymore? Now that I got a taste of the truth, you don't deserve my respect. I was at an utter loss for words. I've been so wrapped up in fear of losing my career that I couldn't care less how my action could affect those who looked up to me. I'm nothing more than a hypocrite. I couldn't live like this anymore. Vitiligo or not, I had to stay true to who I am. I walked straight up to the judges panel and wiped all my foundation away right in front of them. Mr. Finnegan, I no longer fit in your collection. The truth is, my vitiligo has gone. I no longer have any unconventional features. Thus, I'm here to announce that I will cut myself from the show. I'm deeply sorry for all the trouble I caused. I turned to walk out the door, but there stood Samuel. Crystal, I don't understand. I'm sorry, Sam. I'm not the person you think I am. I ran home, hid under the blanket, and cried myself to sleep. Suddenly, a call from my manager woke me up. How can you sleep at this hour? The press is going wild. They're calling you an attention-seeking fraud. I immediately came to my senses and looked up the news. Oh no, how could it break out so fast? At this speed, I'd be cancelled by tomorrow morning. See what happens when you act out of my order? Gosh, you models are so dumb. Don't go anywhere. I'll be there to handle this. Was she being for real? All of this was her idea in the first place. Enough! Have fun dealing with this on your own, Alex. I shut down my phone, packed my stuff, and left it all behind to go to my secret place. I used to spend time here with my family when I was a kid. Being surrounded by nature calms me down. Suddenly a hand pressed on my shoulder. Hey, we've been looking for you. Samuel? And Amanda? Did you guys follow me here? It's the only way we could find you. I'm sorry for going at you like that. I was so shocked. You don't have to. It's all my fault. I lost myself when my vitiligo went away. I acted out of fear and ended up disappointing everyone who's counting on me. <sighs> Well, it's hard to stay sane when your identity is taken from you, but what's important is you've learned your lesson. Now, where is the fearless, confident crystal we all love? She's right. Patches or not, you're always special to us. That means a lot to me. Thanks, you guys. Turns out I'd misunderstood Amanda this whole time. She's brilliant, gorgeous, and caring, and perfect for Samuel. Welp, that stings. Suppose it's time I got back to work for some damage control. I opened the phone to see hundreds of notifications. Among them was a message from Mr. Finnegan, saying he has a place for me at the fashion show. So it's not the end for me, right? Go get it, girl. Yes, it felt so good to be back. Crystal, you're here. I have great news. You'll be the vedette for this collection. Me? But I don't have any unconventional features. Doesn't matter. You're perfect the way you are. Two girls will stand by your side, and you'll be in the center wearing this work of art. An elegant swan among the flock of ugly ducks. Isn't that a bit offensive? So this was your plan all along? Playing dirty tricks to save your flopped career? Cut it, Xena. Mocking me won't change the situation. There's something fishy going on here, and I'm gonna get to the end of it. Finally, the show has come. As soon as I got the signal, I strutted to the runway confidently, turning heads to my every step. But it's not for the reason you're thinking. I actually switched places with Amanda, and now all the spotlights are on her. Right at that moment, Mr. Finnegan bolted to the runway. What do you think you're doing? You ruined my show. I had a deal with her, I- What deal? Tell me. Right. Now. I- 
It's her who's behind this. Alex? Ugh, that snake! It turned out Alex bribed Mr. Finnegan to let me be the vedette and drag the models with unconventional features down since I'm no longer one of them. Hearing that, all the models turned furious, ready to jump at the two frauds. You two have crossed the line. I don't need any of your manipulative games to continue my career. I will stay true to myself no matter what. Unconventional features or not, I'm always willing to speak up for them because everyone is beautiful in their own way and they deserve a chance to showcase their beauty to the world. The audience erupted in cheers and applause while Mr. Finnegan and Alex were surrounded by cameras and criticism. Justice served. After all that drama, I'm still modeling, but with a different agency that fully accepts me for the real me. I continued to influence young people on self-love and being uniquely themselves. Amanda and I became the best of friends. We also made tons of plans to collaborate with Samuel, but honestly, I couldn't shake off this heart-wrenching feeling whenever these two were together. Luckily, my hectic schedule has left me no time to think about that. Guess what? After days and nights of hard work, I now have my own line of skincare products called Only You. Exciting, right? Oh, Sam, you made it! Wow, they're beautiful. Amanda will love them. Uh, no, they're not for Amanda. They're for you. Crystal, I... I'm crazy about you. I always have been. What? It's me you like all along? Then why didn't you tell me that before, silly? I leaped into his arms, and we shared the most amazing kiss. Perfect ending for an amazing journey, huh? Only three more steps to go. Three, two, one... Sophie! Oh man, busted. Okay, so it's because today at school, I persuaded a friend to test out my skateboard. But come on, how was I supposed to know she'd end up breaking her leg? Oops, I called your dad and he's arranging your school transfer. What? Ugh, is anyone else's mom way over the top like mine? My dad's away on business trips a lot, so the majority of the time it's just me and her but we're basically chalk and cheese. Everything I do seems to annoy her. Skateboarding or partying, even breathing, I suppose. Jeez, doesn't she remember what being young was like? Or was she born this boring? Then whenever something happens, she always rings dad and snitches on me. Ugh, speak of the devil. Oh, hi dad. Sophie, it's all sorted. You're transferring to Kings West High School next week. But, but Dad, I don't want to move schools. You brought it onto yourself, young lady. I have an old friend teaching there. I've told her to keep an eye on you. So, you better behave yourself. Poof, he thought he could scare me. As if. I ain't afraid of some cranky teacher. So comes my first day at this place. And this teacher, friend of Dad's, Miss Janet Clark, wouldn't quit gopping at me and she kept on calling on me to answer her stupid questions. Um, no thanks. Ugh, I needed to liven this boring class up. So when the teacher briefly left the room, I immediately put Vaseline on the cap of her water bottle. It was so funny watching her failing to open it and ended up with a smudged hand. Then when she asked the class who was responsible, I grinned as I raised my hand. Another time, I put an air horn on her chair leg, so as soon as she sat down, there was an ear-splitting sound. It's as if she just farted. <laughs> Impressive. How do you think up such crazy pranks? You're even better than me. Huh? I froze for a few seconds. Who was this handsome boy, and why hadn't I noticed him before? Turns out he's Dylan, and like me, he's prone to getting in trouble. We were talking to each other passionately when I felt a hand pat on my shoulder. It was Miss Clark. She led me into the corridor, and I expected her to shout at me, but surprisingly, she didn't get angry or anything. Instead, she asked if I was having a hard time. Hmm? How odd. The next morning, I was about to enter the classroom when some popular girls stopped me. Who are you trying to impress? Better know your place, newbie. She's just another plain Jane. What are you worried about, Rebecca? There's no way Dylan likes her. Stay away from Dylan, else. Excuse me? This snooty girl just messed with the wrong person. And that's how we ended up pulling each other's hair until I managed to get a hold of her wrist 
and was about to give her a taste of my shoulder throw, then Miss Clark intervened. The so-called Queen Bee quickly fled the scene. Then Miss Clark led me out to the schoolyard for a walk. She told me that this girl Rebecca was Dylan's ex-girlfriend. Oh, how pathetic. Our Becky has a crush on her ex? Then Miss Clark continued asking if I really felt okay, as she thought there must be some reason behind my rebellious behaviors. Just like that, my emotions got the better of me, and I blurted out how I hated moving schools, and the only good thing about this new place was Dylan. And could you believe it? She actually gave me some flirting tips to impress Dylan, and also told me to text her if I had any problems. Hmm, maybe I'd been wrong about Miss Clark. She was actually pretty cool, and I started talking to her pretty often. Then one day, I arrived home to see my bedroom door was ajar. I peeked inside and spotted Mum on my bed, iPad in hand, reading my diary on it. Mum, seriously, can you please give me some privacy? Sophie, what's this about a downhill skating event? Do you want to die? It's none of your business. Ugh, Mum was so controlling. She wouldn't let me wear the clothes I wanted or even fangirl over the idols I liked. Feeling so wronged, I called Miss Clark to let out this frustration. She was so understanding, saying how adults sometimes make mistakes too, and my mom was in the wrong this time. Then said I should sign up for the skating event, as I was young and therefore I should fight for my dreams. I wish mom understood me like you do. You must be a wonderful mom. Your children are so lucky. She fell silent for a moment, then told me that as much as she wanted to be a mother, but she was divorced and had no kid. Adopt me then. I'd rather be your daughter than my mom's. Then she gently smiled at me. Thanks to Miss Clark, my stuffy home life felt a bit better. While at school, thanks to her matchmaking, Dylan and I were now a couple. Yay! Rebecca thus gave me dirty looks all the time in class. But tough luck, sweetie. And our one month anniversary finally arrived. Today, Dylan's taking me out for sushi. Yum! But I'd only had one bite when a familiar figure rushed over. My mom glared at Dylan, then dragged me home. Don't you ever talk to that awful boy again! You hear me? That kind of troublemaker is nothing but a bad influence. Cut ties with him ASAP! This was insane! But thankfully, Dylan overlooked my mom's craziness, and we continued dating secretly. But then one morning, I texted and called Dylan a bunch of times, but there was no reply. Was something wrong? We just had the best date last night, but now, nothing. I rushed to school, searching for Dylan, worriedly asking everyone if they had heard anything from him. When Rebecca suddenly approached me. Dylan could have died thanks to you. Seems like you and your crazy mom are cut from the same cloth. Okay, so... Turns out that after Dylan dropped me off after our date, he ended up in an accident. Luckily, he wasn't hurt too bad, but he was convinced someone had tampered with his brakes while he made a quick stop at the 7-Eleven near my house. And, yep, that must have been my mom, since he also saw her leave the store. How could she do that? She's ruined my life! Dylan broke up with me right after that. No way was I staying anywhere near her, so, I packed a bag and fled to the one place I felt safe. And here I am, at Miss Clark's house. <sighs> Peace and quiet at last. Oh, what's this? She looked so pretty when she was young. I turned a few more pages, then... Huh? Why does this man resemble... My dad? Then I saw a scribble. Janet, Bob, forever. Huh? It was my dad. So, she wasn't just his old friend, she was his ex. A thought suddenly popped into my head. Could she be my real mom? Maybe dad let me transfer to her school so we would be reunited. <laughs> Oof, forgive me. I must have watched too many TV dramas. <laughs> but honestly, how amazing would it be if she was my mom? <sighs> my real mom was such a nightmare. I went to the kitchen to see Miss Clark preparing dinner, and couldn't help but blurt out, Mom? She got extremely emotional, 
then pulled me in for a warm embrace and called me her daughter. Suddenly the phone rang. It was dad. He told me to go home immediately or he'd stop my allowance. Miss Clark told me not to be worried and just go. But I had to show some attitude to let mom know that I wouldn't back down easily. So from then on, as soon as I was home, I just went straight to my room without even looking at mom. And also every time she said anything annoying, I kept replying with, what's wrong with you? My teacher told me to do so. Stop overreacting. And you know what happened next? Yep, mom called dad. Again. I reported it to Miss Clark, as usual, and she told me that if I wanted dad to stop listening to mom, I had to tell him she was having an affair. What? Wasn't that too much? Did Miss Clark still have feelings for my dad? Was she only being nice to me so she could worm her way back into his life? After that, I didn't talk to her as much and tried to avoid her at school, just to be safe. But then one day after lessons, I found her waiting by my locker, looking all glum. She told me it was her birthday, but like every other time, she had no one to celebrate it with. If only you'd be by my side this year, my daughter. So I agreed to go for dinner with her, and then for convenience, I made reservations at mom's restaurant. Hmm, maybe this wasn't such a bad idea. I mean, Miss Clark might be able to talk some sense into her, right? They could even actually get on. But as soon as Miss Clark walked in, mom's face dropped. Janet, what are you doing here? Our restaurant is fully booked. Please leave. The two argued back and forth for a while, and I couldn't stand it anymore. Why are you so rude, mom? She's my teacher. Mom then stormed off in a rage while Miss Clark and I just ignored her and carried on with our birthday plan. But as she was eating the baked lobster dish, she suddenly turned a funny color, then threw up. We took her to the emergency room, and the doctor said this was down to Ipecac, a vomit-inducing medicine. Who else is to blame? How could my mom be so cruel? Sophie, I'm fine. I'm sure your mom meant no harm. Mom looked furious and rushed over to Miss Clark. I had to pull her back, and then I told her she didn't deserve to be my mom. She was speechless and burst into tears. But it was too late. I announced I would move out of the house and stay with Miss Clark instead. So I went home and packed straight away, then left. But mom wouldn't quit following me that whole week. It's super annoying. So Miss Clark came up with a new idea. We should move somewhere where mom wouldn't find us. Huh? Was it a bit too sudden? But this was the only way I could be rid of my freaky mom. So, we moved to a little house in the suburbs. Miss Clark took good care of me and completed all of my school transfer procedures. The first few days were so much fun, we had a really good time together. However, I started to notice odd little things, such as she fed me pizza every single day. Pizza and pizza only. She also insisted I wear these worn old clothes and called me Dumpling? What a weird nickname. At first I just wondered why she did that, but then it started to bug me, so I asked her to stop. To my surprise, she started crying. <sighs> Looks like I was stuck with this awful nickname. Things at home seemed off, and the new school was just as terrible. From the very first day, I again became the target of the mean girls. But one day, as they tried to stop me passing them, one of their faces suddenly turned pale. Uh, huh? Isn't that Alice's gross old shirt? Alice who? You know, Alice. The dumb pling. She wore the exact same shirt with the word smart printed on it. I remember this vividly as I used to laugh at how brazen of that stupid girl for wearing a shirt saying smart. My god, even the trace of my cigarette butt on its flap? It's still there? But she's dead. Then they all looked at each other in fear and ran away. H uh, huh? Chills ran down my spine. I didn't know who this Alice was and I didn't want to. The only thing I knew was I needed to get out of this place immediately. So I rushed home to pack my things before Miss Clark got back from work. But it was too late. Dumpling? Where are you going? You have to stay with mommy. Then she quickly locked the door 
dragged me inside and started acting like a psychopath. Eat up, my dumpling. Why are you so sad? It's seafood pizza, your favorite. I'm sorry I didn't let you eat it before, but now you can have it all you want. I'll buy this for you every day. Panicked, I didn't know how to hold out against this insane woman when someone kicked in the door. It was Dylan, followed by my parents. Sophie, here you are, our baby. Oh, thank good God. I pushed Janet away and ran straight to them. But how did they find me? I decided to look into the case of my broken break again, as a few days after the accident, I came back to that 7-Eleven, and a cashier asked me if my mum came home safely the other day, as she saw a woman claiming to be my mum struggling by my motorcycle, saying there's some problem with it. That sounded way too fishy, so I asked to check the store's CCTV footage. And the culprit was not your mum as we all thought, but her. Huh? Why? She helped matchmake us. Why would she want to harm you? I don't know. Maybe she wants everyone to misunderstand and blame your mother. Luckily, our phones have still been sharing locations ever since we were dating, so I found you in time. Many thanks to you, Dylan. My father angrily looked at Miss Clark. Janet, things between us ended decades ago. Please get a hold of yourself. Oof, how ridiculous. Who do you think you are to assume this is about you? Dumpling is mine. She's my daughter and she's staying with me. She broke down crying and then admitted it all. From damaging Dylan's motorbike to putting amnic medicine in her own food to fool people. I've tried everything. I can't believe it. How could a gentle person like her do such things? After the truth was revealed, Everything gradually got back on track. I went back home, but still, my mind constantly wandering back to her and why she did it. Until one day, I came home from school and was surprised to see that woman sitting on the couch in our living room having a coffee with mom. To be honest, I was a bit frightened at the sight of her, but she didn't look as unstable as before. It turned out that she'd just returned from a psychotherapy unit. She'd been suffering from her mental health since Alice, her daughter, passed away. Alice, aka Dumpling, was a stubborn teenager, just like me, and due to the strictness of her mum, she once left home in a temper and never came back, as she got in a terrible car accident that night. So, as soon as Miss Clark saw me, she subconsciously wanted to turn me into her daughter to fix her past mistakes. Sophie, I'm truly sorry for the pain I caused you. I let my grief consume me and, as a result, I refused to accept how dark a place I was in. Teenagers are complicated, but please try to be more open-minded and show them love the correct way. Sophie's a good kid, and I don't want you making the same mistakes I did. Hmm. And so, everything ended in a good way. Although my mom and I still sometimes argue, now we both know how to control it. I also learned to share things with her so that we became closer. And now, when she calls dad, it's no longer to snitch on me, <laughs> but it's to talk about how our days went. By the way, I don't have to go on secret dates anymore either. There's my Prince Charming. How many times have I told him not to rev up the engine? Ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one more to go, and 200,000 followers! <laughs> it looks like I'm making quite an impression on the world. Hey, you're looking at the hottest beauty and lifestyle influencer of Park Springs High School. Beauty and brains? I have both. <laughs> it's not surprising, is it? Obviously, a girl like me gets loads of attention. Oh, there are Nerdy Ben is, my number one fanboy. He's always following me around school and offering to help me with, well, everything. I can't blame him. I mean, I'm basically his queen. Hey, Ben. I didn't see you at my locker as usual. Are you good? I, I'm out of money today, so... Wait, Ben, don't say it like that. People will think I mugged you or something. 
I never ask for those groceries or sundries. Yes, you don't. Um, sorry. Okay, so that was weird. Then things got even stranger when I overheard Christine telling her friends that after being exposed, an anonymous IG singer's followers had skyrocketed to a whopping 500,000. But the thing was, she went to school here. She's that nobody in bio class, Stella. Stella hurried past me into class, followed by a flock of people trying to take her pick and asking her to sing. Blah, blah, blah. Some of the boys even offered to take her home after class. Poof, please. What were they thinking? Ugh. She could play the fragile and confused act on these losers, but she didn't fool me. The dropped book scenario was so overrated. But, huh? Why was Ben rushing to pick it up? What a traitor. Ben? Where's my homework? He couldn't even come up with a better excuse than, Um, I went out last night. This was baloney. I just heard him offer to help Stella with her homework. And guess what? This girl, still with her Little Miss shy facade up, told Ben that she could do her own essay. Ugh. Did she think she was Beyonce or what? Acting all high and thinking she's the beacon of the universe? I was furious. So she wanted a taste of fame, huh? Let's just say, as a senior in this field, having experienced its downside, it was time I taught her some manners. <laughs> After that, I made sure she became the main topic of every single talk in school. Hey, she needed to learn how this fame game worked. Everyone was giggling, pointing, and whispering behind her back. She had to cover herself with a hoodie that hid half of her face and walk through school in anxiety. Yeah. I know that paranoid feeling all too well when you obsess with why people keep on giving you odd looks. Then one day, I was putting my books back in my locker when I glimpsed someone running past me crying. It was Stella. And she dropped a note that said, If I were you, I wouldn't have shown up at school ever again. You're a joke. Gosh, do people even say these things? This was way too harsh. What happened? For God's sake. He didn't think I was the one who wrote this, did he? From that day on, Ben completely ignored me. And worse, he was glued to Stella, comforting her as people talked behind her back. Ugh. Then one day, I was tying my shoelaces when I heard some cheerleaders trying to open someone's phone. Right at that moment, Stella stepped out of the shower stall. Upset to see others violating her privacy, she tried to fight back. But oh boy, this wallflower couldn't even make them budge. <sighs> Fine, I'll help her. But only this time. You tattletale! You think you run the place now just because you're popular? Go tell Ben I didn't put that note in your locker. Better yet, call him right now. Oh, come on! Just run to the bleachers and tell that nerd. Go! What are you looking at? I went over to the bleachers to find Ben comforting Stella. What now? Snitching on me again? Actually, Stella was just telling me that you didn't write that note. Could you be any more foolish? So, you're just gonna bluntly do whatever I tell you to? Don't mind her. It's just who she is. A bit rough, but a truly great friend. Uh, I don't make friends. Yeah, I'd learned it the hard way. Back in my early days on Instagram, the only friend I trusted posted a video of me changing in the school's shower stall. I still had my tea inside my shirt, but that taught me a cruel lesson about friendships and fame. When you're famous, people will always want something from you. You can't trust anyone at all. You hear me? Stella! Who's that? Liam, Stella's friend from the music club. They look good together, don't they? 
What? Are you jealous of him or something? For that silly chick? Ben didn't say anything, but just blankly stared at them. Huh? He never looked at me like that anymore. Now I was no longer the Instagram queen. That meant I was no longer his queen. <sighs> it was true there was no one I could trust. A few days later, there was a big football match. We were going up against our rival school for the final, and Stella was singing the national anthem. Even the mayor and a local TV station showed up for it. Crazy! Ben was part of the AV team, so when some dude told me Ben wanted to talk to me, I went to the AV room to find him. What did he want to talk about? Hopefully not something to do with Stella. Ugh! But as I got there, no one was around. Huh? Right at that moment, the screen showed Stella stepping up to the podium preparing to sing. But instead of the soothing melody, a string of strange, distorted sounds came out of her mic. What was going on? What are you doing here? Ashley! He pushed me aside and hurriedly fixed the sound system. And just a minute later, things were back to normal and Stella could restart the song. Ben gave me an accusing look, then dragged me behind the bleachers, where we met up with Stella and Liam. Then Ben told her I'd messed with her mic. Oof! How could he think I was capable of something like that? Meanwhile, this Liam guy stepped in, saying it could have been a technical error. Yeah, whatever. I went to leave, but Liam caught up with me. Weird. Weren't he and Stella having a thing? He immediately denied it, saying they were just acquaintances from music club. But you, I've been wanting to get closer to you for a while. You're the true Instagram queen, not Stella. Whoa, this guy was a top-class jerk. Just a minute ago, he had his hands wrapped around Stella, and now he was trying to leech onto me. He even started leaning in to kiss me on the cheek. Quickly, I dodged it as I met Stella's gloomy look from behind. Yikes. It was time to get out of here. I didn't sleep so well. Ugh. All this stress was bad for my skin. So I was groggily making my way along the school corridor when Stella stormed up to me. It was you, wasn't it? You were so mean to me, threatening to delete my IG account because you were so jealous Ben had left you for me. Now it's really gone, and it's all your fault! What are you talking about? I had nothing to do with your stupid account. Yeah, I gossiped about you to mess with you a bit, but that was all. And you, you think I did it too? Excuse me? Did he just ignore me? And there Ben was, my so-called friend who turned his back at me right at the moment I needed him the most. And I'd never threatened to delete her account. Why did she make it up? Was she that jealous of me and Liam yesterday? What's this? An unexpected message from Liam said, Hey Ashley, don't worry sweetie, I've got your back. What do you say we meet at 8 p.m. in the park? Ugh, this shameless two-faced jerk. What was he up to this time? So after class, I slid a note into Stella's locker, pretending to be from Liam saying, I have a surprise for you. See you at 8 p.m. in the park. I arrived on time to find Liam already waiting. He kept putting on this simping act like he was madly in love with me or something. I can help you prove everything, and I only ask for one tiny favor, that you'll be my girlfriend. You can do that? But how? Well, you can just simply put the blame on someone else. Let's say, Ben? Oh, honey, you don't have to do anything. Just come to me and let your man handle it. Ugh, this guy made me want to barf. But I still had to play it cool so I could figure out what this dude had up his sleeves. Sounds interesting, but I want to know more. How are you going to carry out your master plan? Honey, I've already got all the pieces of evidence in my hands. <laughs> you mean... That's right. I was the one who deleted Stella's IG account, and I know a way to blame it on someone else. 
You did what? Ashley, I let my jealousy blind me. So when I saw him flirting with you right in front of me, I, I just lost it. At least you're not the only fool around here. He played both of us. And for the record, he's so not my type. <laughs> <laughs> Your type? Hmm, let me guess. Someone like... Ben? <laughs> he's such an idiot. He'd never realize I have feelings for him. But you're more of his type than I am. Besides, the way he just abandoned me when I needed him the most. Uh, Ashley, I didn't mean to hurt you like that. What? You've been there the entire time? Yeah, I've heard it all. Including the part about how you have feelings for me. Look, it's not what you think. I'm not into Stella that way. The thing is, I saw her singing at a coffee shop and realized right away she's my favorite anonymous singer on Instagram, so I sort of revealed her identity online. One thing led to another. I felt so guilty I just stayed by Stella's side and accidentally pushed you away. And it's not that I don't trust you. After you left, I tried to convince everyone you didn't do it, but they didn't believe me. Then Stella showed me the note in her locker of Liam asking her out. And I recognized your handwriting. I got worried, so... So... You didn't turn on me? Yeah. I know you can seem cold sometimes. But deep down, you have a good heart. So, turns out that Stella going viral meant some local lounge singer had lost a lot of gigs. So she hired Liam to delete Stella's account for good. This guy was no joke. The note, the cheerleaders, the mic accident. He was responsible for it all. Luckily for me, I'd managed to put my phone on record mode for the entire conversation I had with him. So the next day, I went ahead and reported him to the principal. Well, no bad deed goes unpunished. So I hope you enjoy your indefinite suspension, Liam. <laughs> As for me, I no longer go solo anymore, as I have a new friend by my side, who now has quit social media and enjoys her passion for singing. And Ben is still Ben. Such a doofus. But my doofus. Not every day a girl outside the aerospace community like me could attend this creative science festival thingy, but here I was, all thanks to my genius boyfriend Mike, who just got accepted into MIT's aerospace engineering program. This is all really interesting. So great that Mike brought me here. Hey, you ruined my project. Who are you? Sorry, I, I'm Mike's, Mike? I can't believe he's talking to another girl when his girlfriend is in trouble here. The girl followed Mike and immediately fixed the model I just broke. Such an unfortunate brain behind her flashy clothes. Shh, keep it down. She's Mike's girlfriend. Really? Our valedictorian is into airheads? Huh? I thought Mike and Liana were a thing. Liana, the pretty girl who just fixed a freaking spacecraft model in a split second is being paired with my boyfriend? I'm Chloe, by the way. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself sooner. I just, ugh, never felt so self-conscious before. Mike and I have been together since high school. Back then, I was popular and had many boys chasing me. Everyone seemed amazed that a girl like me was with a nerd like him. But now, Mike's already an intern at NASA despite being only a freshman. Looks like he's a celebrity among his peers, and I was just his brainless girlfriend. For the first time ever, I felt like I had no place being such an elite student's girlfriend. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened at the science festival, so I decided to talk about it in my talk show, Bubble Buzz. Although I didn't show my face, I had heaps of listeners and every time the show was on, they flooded my comments section with excitement. Welcome back, my friends. So today's topic is, can a person's heart change when they go to college? I have a friend, Sally. She's been with her boyfriend for two years, 10 months and 21 days. But now he's gone to college in another state, living among new friends and new girls. Should she be worried that she'll become old news? Obviously, out of sight, out of mind, your friend should dump him before he does. No matter how good a relationship is, it can't escape the three-year curse. 
The three-year thing is real. All high school romances are doomed in the real world. Mike and I had been together for almost three years. Was this three-year curse really hitting us? Every comment seemed to believe it, while user Twinkle Star seemed to think this whole curse was silly. Curses don't exist. Relationships aren't easy. Both partners have to be willing to make an effort in their long-term relationship. Two years or ten years, it's irrelevant. Why does someone as serious as Twinkle Star listen to my show anyway? Since my early days hosting the show, this person always comments with confusing and boring quotes. I'm sure the curse was not a silly thing at all. Whether it was my three-year friendship with my first best friend Ella, or my parents divorcing after three years of marriage, the three-year milestone was real. Actually, I do know one couple who beat the curse. They're my grandparents. Grandpa's rather a cold and reserved person who only had eyes for his wife. So I asked Grandma what the secret to their successful relationship was. First, be grateful for your partner and not take love for granted. Second, know him better than you know yourself. Third, learn to forgive and apologize. Was that it? That wasn't exactly helpful. Our relationship was in a life or death situation and I needed to really do something. Right that moment, someone appeared in the kitchen and I couldn't believe it. My sister Mindy. I hadn't seen her in ages since she moved out with dad. I explained my fears to Mindy and she seemed to understand exactly why I was so concerned. Don't worry, sis. I'll stay here for a while so I can help you two overcome this curse and reignite your passion. First of all, as Mike's the biggest nerd I know, you need to appear more academic. Taking Mindy's advice, I gave myself this academia aesthetic, then went to see Mike at the amusement park. Oh look, there he is. Huh? Chloe? Um, you look different. Since when did you wear glasses? I've, um, always worn them, Mike. You must not have noticed. I stayed up late last night to watch a physics documentary. Now it's time to impress Mike with my knowledge about how water fountains actually work without electricity and run solely on gravity. How the fat in ice cream impacts the freezing point, and I could taste the fat droplets. And how g-force and inertia were taken into account when mechanics made roller coasters for the thrill. But he didn't seem impressed at all. Chloe, you're not yourself today. Are you okay? I'm not okay. I've been wiggling my foot at you for ages, but you never noticed my undone laces. You didn't let me try your ice cream first, as you always do, and you didn't notice the effort I put into learning all this sciencey stuff for you. I'm sorry. I have this big project on my mind, and... Mike Jenkins, you've changed. The Mike I know and love was attentive and wouldn't let me walk around with untied shoes. You don't love me anymore. It all got too much for me, so I hurried off. Well, as quickly as I could with my shoelaces flailing. As soon as I got home, I phoned Mindy and told her everything. I was so lucky to have my big sis. OMG, he did what? It sounds like he just doesn't care about you anymore. Do you think? Um, maybe... Maybe he was just... No. If he cared, he would have come after you. Instead, he let you walk on dangerous sneakers. Mindy was right. Mike grew cold on me. This three-year curse was real. Now what should I do? There's only one thing. You'll have to test him. I've been sitting here for the past hour and Mike hasn't... Here he comes. This was Mindy's idea. Faking a car malfunction and calling Mike for help. Wow, you're so good. I'd still be stranded here alone without you. You could have asked someone else or called a garage. There wasn't even anything wrong with... It doesn't matter. But you're my boyfriend. Yes, your very busy boyfriend who lives in a different state. Anyway, I got a dash, and we'll have to take a rain check on next week. I have a lot on my plate. Then Mike left, leaving me more afraid of losing him than ever. As if he just left. His new environment changed him even more than I thought. Chloe, you have to infiltrate his space now before you lose him forever. So I went sneaking into Mike's dorm room and transformed it from nerdy to romantic chic. I hear footsteps. I better hide. I can't wait for him to see it. There's Mike, but... Huh? Who's with him? Oh, wow. Romantic much? Then the other person started taking their clothes off? I leaped out of the closet ready to tackle this man-stealer to the ground, but... Hold on a second. That's actually a man. Mike's roommate, Gus? Chloe, um, what are you doing here? I'm sorry. I just wanted to surprise you and... and ask you to come on a date with me today, tomorrow, whenever you're free? I told you I'm busy this week. I have an inspection tomorrow. So, you mean I'm bothering you? You don't need me anymore? Here, you can use my ID card and go with Mike to the inspection. Make it a hot date. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. One way or another, my infiltration mission was a success. Hehehe. <laughs>
The next day, I came to this technical area with Mike and just stuck to him, not knowing what else I was supposed to do. Chloe, don't touch anything, okay? Mike, there you are. You have to come and see this. She dragged him off, and did she just smirk at me? Ugh, what an awful pick-me girl. She was obviously trying to separate us. No way was I gonna let her get away with that. I'd show them all that I deserve to be with him. While Liana's by herself walking around with a VR headset, I came to tell her to keep her hands off my boyfriend. Oh, there you are. Stay away from Mike. Little do you know that he has a girlfriend. You're just a clingy airhead that he's too polite to break up with. I'm the perfect girl for him, not you. I, I'm the most influential radio host on social media, and a third wheel like you call me an airhead? I'll make sure everyone knows what a horrible person you are. Really, so scary. As if I'll be worried about those pathetic gossip girls. How dare she? I pushed her, and suddenly, smash! Her headset broke into pieces on the floor. Oh no, Mike told me not to touch anything. What are you doing here? What happened? I'm so sorry, Chloe. I know that you're not okay with this whole thing, but I'm Mike's teammate and we have to interact a lot. Nothing is going on between us. You're overreacting. Then she ran away in tears like she wasn't at fault. She's lying. I didn't say that. She said she wants. Chloe, enough. I'm too busy to worry about what chaos you're gonna cause next. I think we should take a break. He took the ID pass off me, leaving me feeling like my whole world had crumbled. After crying an ocean of tears, I decided to make this right. I threw away my ego and texted him first, but before I hit send, I received a message from Mike saying he was sorry and we would have a trip to celebrate our three-year anniversary. This meant we weren't over and the curse wasn't true. Ooh, I needed to figure out which outfits to bring. I got everything packed and ready for our vacation of a lifetime. It was gonna be so romantic. But all of a sudden, Liana rushed to us and flung her arms around Mike. My pet dog, Nova, she's, she's passed away. I can't be alone right now. I'd rather die. That lying party pooper. Poor Mike didn't know what to say, so she just jumped in the back seat without my permission. No problem. The more, the merrier. I'll invite my sister to join us too. Mindy proved to be super useful, always interjecting whenever Liana approached Mike. But Liana just became more and more shameless. She glued herself to Mike and had the audacity to lie down next to him like I was invisible and even ate his ice cream. Worse still, my oblivious boyfriend didn't seem bothered at all. She's more cunning than I thought. You need to step up your game. It was such a beautiful night, but that third wheel Liana was buzzing around Mike like a mosquito. Then she started talking about physics stuff, and now he's so caught up in their conversation, I may as well have disappeared. Hmm, how could I make Liana see Mike loves me, not her? Well, I wasn't sure if he loves me anymore. Chloe, 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 you long for attention so badly you're willing to hurt yourself. She's already hurt because of you. This is her special three-year anniversary, and you invited yourself like how you've always wormed your way in. I bet you don't even have a dog. I diverted my gaze from a fake crying Liana to a confused looking Mike. Chloe, what are you trying to do? I'm worried you've lost your passion for me because we're at the three-year mark. We have different interests and I can't help but feel insecure about us. If you keep acting like this, well, I just don't know. I've been thinking about our future too, and I've decided it's time for us to... Oh, no, no, no! This isn't happening! I think I'm pregnant! <laughs> we got back two days ago, and Mike still hadn't contacted me. This curse had caught up with me, and I lost him for good. I just wish I hadn't lied about the baby. Then maybe our breakup wouldn't have been so awkward. This called for retail therapy. I stepped outside and saw Mike with a massive suitcase. Chloe, I've abandoned the project and dropped out of college. I'm going to take care of you, both of you. Mike scurried around the house to make it pregnant woman friendly. He threw out all junk food, coffee, and even mayonnaise. Also, my high heels were packed away and Mozart was played everywhere in the house. Apparently, it'll make the baby a genius. We were going to have the perfect, happy family life. But when I went to my room to get my laptop for my next radio show, I couldn't find it anywhere. I asked Mike and he said, I packed it up with your high heels, makeup, books, and put them all in storage. You don't need any distractions. Just me, you, and the baby from now on. No more radio, studying, or friends. We can have a bunch of kids and grow old in this house. What? This wasn't what I wanted. Neither of us should have boring, unfulfilling lives or give up our dreams, right? I might
might not have my laptop, but I still had my phone. Welcome back. Today's topic is my friend Sally again. She lied about being pregnant so her boyfriend wouldn't leave her. Should she keep lying or tell the truth? This time, Twinkle Star appeared again. I know she's always been a brave girl who isn't afraid of admitting her own faults and correcting her mistakes. She should tell her boyfriend the truth and explain how much she loves him. Hmm, sounds oddly specific. Who's this person? Actually, Bubble Buzz, we know each other. Before I could ask him anything else, Twinkle Star went offline. Whoever that was, I think they were right. So I went downstairs to talk to Mike, only he wasn't there. Instead, Mindy jumped out of nowhere holding a pregnancy test and a bottle of Coke. I just need to dunk this in here and the plus sign will show up clear as day in case Mike has any doubt about the baby. No need to, I'm going to tell him the truth. Are you sure about that? What if Mike gets mad? I stopped and thought about it. No, as scary as it was, I couldn't do this anymore. I was looking out for Mike by telling him the truth. Where was he? He had to be around here somewhere. Liana, why was she here with Mike? Mike, I'm sorry, but Chloe's not pregnant. She admitted on her radio show. You deserve to be with someone who wouldn't make up such awful lies. Someone like me. Oh no, I lost the chance to tell him firsthand. Now Mike would never talk to me ever again. Chloe, wait. I couldn't turn around and bear the disappointment in his eyes. I couldn't blame anyone, any third wheel or curse for destroying my relationship. Hey there, I know this is an unscheduled show, but I wanted to talk to y'all. That girl I talked about yesterday, Sally, well, she's me. I faked being pregnant to keep my relationship, but my boyfriend hates me now. I was so terrified of this three-year curse that I became this jealous monster. Mike even dropped out because of me. I'm so selfish for expecting him to spend every minute of his day with me. He needs his own life too. We both do. It's the time apart that makes our time together more exciting and our love more passionate. Now we've broken up and it's all my fault. I stopped to catch my breath. Who told you I wanted to break up? Didn't, didn't you say you thought carefully about our future and made a decision? You know what, after all your silly shenanigans, including faking your pregnancy, I'm still madly in love with you. So the decision I made was, Chloe Ruth Evanson, you're crazy, kooky, and one of a kind. I can't stand the thought of not having you in my life. Will you marry me? Yes? But Mike, after our engagement, you should continue your studies, projects, internship and whatnot. You don't have to stay by my side all the time. What? I thought you'd like that. We can be together all day and make enough babies for a soccer team, right? Relax, I'm just kidding. I knew you were lying about the baby all along. Your grandpa told me. Turns out, Twinkle Star was none other than my grandpa, who saw that I needed some guidance and tried to give me objective advice. Mike only went along with the lie to tease me. Hmm, who knew my nerdy boyfriend could be so playful? Or should I say, my fiancé? Mom, come here and see what Agnes has done to my dress. Oh no, what now? Look at this, Mom. It's crumpled. This is all your fault. I told you that this requires hand washing. That means by hand. Oh, don't cry, honey. I'll buy you a new one. You can give that one to Agnes. It's yours now. New dress. Happy, huh? Can we go right now, Mom? Then let's have pizza after that. I'm so tired of Agnes's pretentious fine dining dishes. Of course, honey. Yeah. I know. That sure looked like a scene from Cinderella, right? Only stuff like that was a daily occurrence in this house. If I was adopted, then it'd be easier to understand why mom favored my sister over me. But nope, I am also her actual daughter. Growing up with Jenna as my big sister was a nightmare. She's always been the golden child, while I was treated like a thorn in their side. If something broke, then I got the blame. When Jenna stole my things, then mom just said I should be flattered. Then there were the birthday parties. Over the years, Jenna had it all. Fairy-themed ones, magicians, a petting zoo, and cupcake towers. As for me, all I ever got was a card with a wrinkled $20 note in it. It was the same thing with studying. If she broke her string of D's with a C, mom rewarded her with jewelry and makeup. Me? Just one C out of usual straight A's, and mom say, oh, why did I even get my hopes up? Sometimes I do wonder if all this shabbiness is because Jenna's always been pretty and popular. 
She's basically a mini-me version of mom. While I guess I'm more reserved, and I don't really look like mom. Anyways, despite living in a house full of darkness and unfairness, I still have my own passion, which is culinary. To be honest, I'm addicted to those TV cooking shows and always try to find ways to follow them. My dream is to become a head chef in a five-star restaurant. At school, Jenna always blanks me. She hangs out with this group of girls who are all obsessed with the same things she is, such as makeup, trendy clothes, and TikTok. Jenna does look gorgeous, so it's not surprising that boys usually buzz around her in the hope of catching her attention. Anyway, forget Jenna, as I have my best friend Ruth right here. Girl, I swear to God, if I were you, I'd tear up some of her clothes just for my own relief. Nice idea, <laughs> I said while playing with my tray of food as usual. It looks so good. Very appetizing. Startled, I looked up to find a pair of dazzling eyes staring back at me. Hi, I'm Roy. That's very neat-handed of you. Before I could say anything, he winked and turned away to his table. That was close, or else he would have seen my tomato red face. <laughs> Looks like someone's on the hot guy's radar. Shut up. He was just being friendly. But no, that night when I got home, Roy in fact did message me. And we had a really long chat. He even asked me to join him for lunch the next day. Yay! This was so exciting. I'd entered the canteen to find Roy was already sitting there waiting for me, but I quickly spotted Jenna's group passing by, and the last thing I need is trouble from my evil sister. So I was actually thinking of walking away. But right at that moment, Roy grinned and waved over at me. OMG, that hot boy over there is waving at you, Jen. A girl flattered Jenna before I could even answer Roy. Jenna quickly fixed her hair, then smiled awkwardly at him. But he walked straight past her and over to me. Here. For you. What kind of first-class dishes do we have today? I smiled at Roy and had no choice but to sit down with him, ignoring Jenna's furious glare. Despite the awkward Jenna situation, lunch with Roy was amazing. We started hanging out loads more after that. He's cute, funny, and very supportive towards my culinary dreams. Then one day, Roy handed me a cupcake with a frosted heart on it and asked me to be his girlfriend. Yippee! This was so exciting! So, of course I agreed, but only on the condition that we kept our relationship low-key. I'd never had anything of my own before, so if my mom and sister didn't know about us, then they couldn't tarnish it, right? Falling in love is a magical thing. I was just so happy and full of life all of the time. Even doing chores for mom and Jenna didn't dampen my mood. I thought you were only into cooking. So what, you like laundry now? Psst, don't tell me you want to be a fashion designer next. I ignored her and carried on with what I was doing. Actually, I ignored all of Mom and Jenna's mocking jibes. The truth was, I was way too happy to let them bother me anymore. Soon, Jenna's 17th birthday party arrived, and this time, she insisted on having it at this trendy restaurant in town. All of our relatives and her friends were invited, but I decided not to go. It's not like anyone wanted me there anyway, so I didn't think it'd matter. But to my surprise, on the day of the party, Jenna knocked on my bedroom door and begged me to come. Please, Agnes, I want you there on my special day. It won't be the same without you. Then she passed me a bag and left. I opened it, and inside was the most beautiful dress. Okay, so Jenna being nice was strange, but I must admit it felt good to feel wanted for once. So it looks like I was going to the ball. Wow, the party was insane. I'm talking banners, balloons, a whole booth devoted to presents, a menu only serving Jenna's favorite foods. I was sipping my drink, feeling awkward, when Jenna addressed the room. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my 17th birthday party. Now, there's a very special guest here that I'd like to introduce to you all. It's my new boyfriend, Roy. I watched with horror as Roy appeared out of the crowd and let Jenna link arms with him. Huh? What? Why was my boyfriend with my sister? I glared straight at him, but he couldn't meet my gaze. This was terrible. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Panicked, I rushed outside to get some air. Everything of yours will soon be mine, no matter how well you hide it. I turned to see that Jenna was standing there, a huge smirk on her face. How could she be this shameless? I shoved past her and went to find mom. She was shouting at the waiter to bring out more drinks. I went up to her and spluttered out what Jenna had done and how upset I was. Jeez! Stop making such a fuss about it. Jenna's your sister, so just be happy for her. Besides, 
Roy is far more suited to her than you. Oh, that's it. I can't stand this selfish family anymore. I'm leaving. Yeah, go. Disappear just like your no good father did. That night I showed up at Ruth's house with a bag of my stuff and a teary face. But I knew this could only be temporary, so I still looked around for somewhere else to stay. And eventually I applied for a job as a grocery cashier at a 24-7 gas station. Well, at least I had shelter. One night, a drunk man walked in. Hmm, he didn't look so good. Nothing could lighten a person's mood better than great food, right? The store was quiet, so I took some of the ingredients available and used them to prepare a delicious-looking dish for him. Thank you so much, sweetie. I'm Keith. You have a culinary talent. If you want a better opportunity, come find me. Before I could thank him, he left. Let's see. Bar owner? Hmm. I wasn't old enough to work in a bar, though. I spent the next month juggling school with work, life, and oh boy, was it exhausting. But when I asked for my salary, my boss laughed in my face, saying that since I was only 16, he could only pay me for far less hours than I'd worked? What? That wasn't fair. I worked my butt off on sometimes 12-hour-long shifts. But when I complained, he threatened to report me for stealing food from the store. Ugh, I'd only taken expired food that couldn't be sold anyway. Feeling bummed out, I just quit, and then left. I wandered around the street for a while, then looked up and found myself standing in front of that man's bar. Well, I had nowhere else to go, so I stepped inside and there was Keith, but... Huh? He looked so different. Other than this bar, I also own a fine dining restaurant uptown. If you want, I'd love to train you to become a chef there. Whoa, this was so amazing that I cried with joy. In order to be able to stay overnight at the restaurant, I told him that my parents had passed away and I'd run away from the orphanage. And the man agreed without questioning me twice. Time passed by, and you know what? I loved working at the restaurant. As for Keith, he's such a kind-hearted man. We grew so close, and he became like a father to me. I guess we were two lonely people who helped each other. So, it made sense when he asked to adopt me. Then one busy evening, I was taking food to a table, but then I stopped dead. Sitting there were Jenna and Roy. On seeing me, Jenna sneered out, Oh, you work here? Now that explains why my appetizers were gross. Roy looked embarrassed and begged her to be quiet, which only made her worse. Then seeing what was going on, Alistair, the restaurant supervisor, came to my defense, but it only made Jenna even more heated. Isn't the customer always king? Why are you defending that dumb girl? Miss, this is a fine dining restaurant. Please mind your manners. Agnes here is not only a very talented chef, but she's the owner's daughter, which makes her my boss. So I think I'm within my rights to defend my superiors. Jenna rolled her eyes at me, then walked away in anger, not forgetting to reply, Just you wait, Agnes. Then seeing my glum face, Alistair invited me out for ice cream after work. Keith happily told us to go and said he'd close the restaurant. As I was licking my ice cream, I noticed people around us shout, Fire! Fire! So I pulled Alistair's hand and ran after them. As the flames came into view, my heart sank when I realized they were coming from... It was the restaurant! Oh no! Keith was still in there! Without giving it a second thought, I charged in there to find him. It was so smoky and impossible to see, but I couldn't give up. Suddenly, I started to go dizzy and lightheaded. Then an arm grabbed me and pulled me out. It was Alistair, and standing next to him was... Keith. Phew! A few days later, the police called Keith. They'd found the culprit who started the fire. As soon as I walked into the police station, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Jenna. But most surprisingly, when Keith saw my mom, they both turned pale and gave astonished looks. Huh? Did they know each other? So yeah, turns out Keith's mine and Jenna's actual father. When dad was young, he hadn't built his career, but just spent all day in the kitchen. So he was always despised and scolded by my mom. In the end, he couldn't take her belittling of him anymore, so he left. Only unbeknown to him, mom was pregnant with me at the time. So the story she said about dad running off with his mistress was all lies. I got it now. She despised me because I took after my dad, not her. As soon as Jenna realized he was our dad and he was rich, she put on her little Miss Sweet act and begged for him to be her dad again. But he just gave her a stern look and said, That fire of yours could have killed us all. Now you have to live with that. Then he took my arm and led me out of there. I always believed my life would one day be better, but I never imagined it'd be as good as this. I now have an amazing dad, a job I'm passionate about, and people who generally care about me by my side. 
It just goes to show that everything works out perfectly in the end. Hi everyone, I'm Lydia, and I'm gonna tell you my amazing but totally bizarre story. But before I do, please like and subscribe. I have a big sister, Gwen, who's two years older than me, and she's basically a genius. From as young as I remember, I idolized her. What is 25 squared? 625, Dad. Honey, what's this? It's the Starry Night, an oil-on-canvas painting painted in June 1889 by the Dutch post-impressionist painter Vincent van Gogh. While I'm, yeah, a bit different. And Lydia, I have ten candies. I'll give you two. So how many do I have left? Isn't this doll cute, Daddy? Yeah, I'm no genius, with no particular talent, no flawless beauty, and almost no friends either. But Gwen didn't mind and was always supportive of me. It's fabulous! Fabulous! It's fabulous! That's why I adored her a lot and try to copy everything she did. It's fabulous! What's so fabulous about my cat dying? Oops, wrong timing. Then, when I was 16, Gwen left for college. Out of sight, but definitely not out of mind. My parents went on about her all the time, which only made me miss her more. I dreamed of going off to college and having a perfect life, as she did. But for that to happen, I needed to shake up my plain Jane life. Hmm, I wonder what my hidden talent is. Could it be dancing? Uh, no, definitely not. Okay, maybe singing would be better. Right now I'm in a state of mind. I want to be in like all the time. Ain't got no tears left to cur- That's enough. Next. Gosh, why can Gwen make it seem so easy? But at least my grades didn't fail me. I studied my butt off and finally got into law school just like Gwen did, then moved out. Yahoo! So here comes my first day of college. Send me spiritual strength, Gwenny. I successfully joined the cheerleading team and boys started noticing me. But I only had eyes for Ethan, mm, my super handsome boyfriend. Finally, I achieved the life I always wanted. Thanks, sis, my real life role model. Then one day, I arrived home to see a familiar figure waiting for me. Gwen! I was so happy, thinking she'd finally freed up time to visit me, but she looked so upset, and had gained weight. A bit? <laughs> College life seems to have fattened you up. Lydia, I'm pregnant. What the chocolate fudge? One eternity later. I finally managed to close my goldfish mouth, then invited her inside. I dropped out of college six months ago, then found out I was expecting a baby right after. My due date's in just two weeks, and I have nowhere to go. Please, Lydia, let me stay here. Our parents must not find out. I can't face their disappointment. How about my disappointment? She was meant to be perfect, but she's just ruined everything. What about the father? Uh, um, he has to study in France, so you're the only one I can rely on right now. As mad as I was, I still felt sorry for her. She is my sister, after all. So I let her stay, but refused to talk to her. During the whole week, she hardly slept a wink. She plodded around the place, constantly trying to rub her back and tensing through the pain. I hated seeing her in so much discomfort, so yes, I caved. Together, we prepared for the arrival of our new family member, and I have to admit it, I was kind of excited. Let's find an adorable, meaningful name. Okay, let me do some research. Love Rosie is my favorite movie, so let's name her Rosie. Wow, that's fast. Baby Rosie was born healthy and happy. We three had such a good time until one day, I arrived home from college to find a note and an envelope inside Rosie's crib. My darling Lydia, I'll be away for a while longer. Two months, I suppose. I have to make some changes so that I can provide for Rosie. Please take care of her for me and do not tell anyone about this. I will be forever grateful for this. G. O. M. G. How could she do this to me? I still have college, my friends, Ethan, and, and now a niece? But when I turned to see Rosie smiling at me with those big, round, sparkling eyes, suddenly my heart melted. I can do this. Rosie, looks like it's just the two of us now. Mommy will be back soon, so please make things easy, won't you? 
She absolutely did not. Sometimes I wondered if Rosie was real or an AI program because every night at 3 a.m. sharp, she would cry her lungs out. And if her milk was a little colder than 98.6, she'd spit it all out. Not to mention, I have to come up with a thousand ridiculous ways to keep her entertained. And my house was always filled with a smell of stinky diapers. But other than that, Rosie was very sweet. I can't bring myself to get angry at her. I had no other option but to take online lessons instead of going to class. One time, I forgot to turn off the mic, and suddenly, Rosie farted so loudly that the entire class immediately flocked around to look. Another time, I was so exhausted from staying up all night that I felt my eyelids drooping. Then, Lydia! Yes, dear! Milk is coming! I don't think milk works for you, but an F will! Oh no, no! Despite my constant apologizing, I still ended up with poor results. This semester, I'd already failed two classes and been kicked out of the cheerleading team. You think that is the worst part? Think again. On a super lucky day, I was at Walmart, overwhelmed with dozens of diaper brands when I saw none other than Ethan. There's nowhere to hide, Lydia. You're doomed. Oh, hi, Ethan. Didn't expect to see you here. Sorry, recently I'm a bit busy. Do I know you? Huh? I'm Lydia, your girlfriend? What? It's really you? You ghosted me for the past few weeks. Jeez. Uh, did you even take a shower? And what's that thing? <gasps> Wanna trap me with a baby? No, no, she's not my child. And it's true that I forgot to wash my hands after changing Rosie's diaper this morning, but anyway, please, I just need to look after her for a few more weeks and everything will be back to normal. That's enough. Look at you. You're just like a cave girl. By the way, use this. And you know what? We're over. No words can explain how pathetic I am right now. It's all because of your mom. She's such a... Ugh. Now my life's a living misery, all because of you two. Ah! Shh. I'm sorry, Rosie, I didn't mean it. None of this is your fault. Two months is almost up. When your mom's back, things will be okay again. But two months passed, and Gwen was still nowhere to be found. Worse still, the money she left ran out. I had no choice but to find work, so I took a personal tutor job where students came to my place to study. Not a single soul applied, until one day I opened the door to see this guy. Hello, can I help you? I saw this flyer and want to attend the class. Oh, really? Uh, sure, come on in. Turns out, he's Augustin. He wanted to get onto the same law course as me, but last year, he didn't make the grade. I tried my best to keep an eye on both Rosie and Augustin in separate rooms, but once in a while, Rosie let out a squeak. You hear that? Um, that's my cat. Solve this equation. I need to go to the toilet. But you went 10 minutes ago. I have a small bladder. It runs in my family. Any problems? If you fall in love with someone, just confess like this. My love for you is like diarrhea. I can't hold it in. Mwahaha. Disgusting. I pity anyone who falls in love with him. I hurried back in to see him on his phone. So much for working hard. Huh. Hey, if you really want to get into college, at least put some effort into it. <laughs> like how you did your Snow White makeup. Oh no, it's baby powder. Uh, it's flour. I'm making bread. Didn't know you can make bread in the toilet. It's okay, teen mom. No need to hide your baby anymore. No judgment here. Seeing as the game was up, I told Augustin the truth. Surprisingly, he seemed understanding and even asked if he could see Rosie. Whoa, who knew Mr. Jokester could be so good with babies? I've never seen Rosie so full of joy and laughter like that. Gradually, I no longer saw him as my student, but more like a friend. It's not like he came to my place to study anyway. <laughs> we talked a lot, even outside tutoring sessions, and I learned so much about him. You'll never fulfill your law school dreams by playing games all the time over studying. Who said law school is my dream? And this is not a game. Huh, a fashion website? Don't tell me it's yours. Yeah, I'm the founder of this brand. No way. And what's this? Can you really sell this plain cap for $200? It's not about the cap. It's about the brand's design. He then told me he had always dreamt of opening his own fashion chain, but his parents never supported it and just wanted him to be a lawyer like them. That's why he was never serious about his studies and messed about. So what's your dream? Become the best judge in America? It's totally not a hard question, but why am I speechless? I just want to be as cool as my sister, but she's not so cool anymore. 
Right then, Rosie squealed and filled her diaper, which somehow saved me from the situation. But Augustine's question got me thinking. I need to find the answer. You look distracted. What's on your mind? I found it! I want to be perfect! That's vague. How do you define perfect, though? Does it make you happy? I... I'm not sure. How about this? Have you ever thought about it? Oh, this is nonsense. Forget it. Hmm, I've forgotten to take care of myself for so long. My boyfriend dumped me, and now my friends also ignored me. I became a loser, all because of a baby. Right then, my lecturer emailed me. A last-minute spot had come up on the debate team for the most important competition of the year. This is my big chance! But how was I supposed to care for Rosie and prepare for it? After a whole night of tossing and turning, the doorbell woke me. Was it Gwen? Oh, it's just some strange guy. Hi, you must be Lydia, Gwen's sister. I'm Kyle, Gwen's boyfriend, and her baby daddy. What on earth? Look at him! I didn't know Gwen had such a weird taste in men. Aren't you studying in France or something? What? Um, I mean, yeah, but without my baby, France, Germany, or even the North Pole are all meaningless. Can I see her now? And after that was the reunion of the century. Thanks for taking good care of Rosie, but now I'll do it. That's my duty as her father anyway. Kyle might look intimidating, but he seemed to love Rosie sincerely. So even though it broke my heart, I gave Rosie to her dad. Besides, there's a huge opportunity waiting for me. I put all of my focus into studying, and it was all going amazingly. I ate the competition and left no crumbs, then even got invited back onto the cheerleading team. My dream life was back! But why did I feel like I had this big hole inside of me? Congratulations, best debater of the state! Thanks. Sup? You took back everything you wanted. Why the long face? Uh, I don't know. I just feel empty. So, what can we do to make you feel happy right now? So, here we are, at Rosie's place. What's that loud crying and scolding sound? I impatiently pressed the bell, and Kyle took forever to answer. OMG, is that cigarette smoke? <coughs> and look at the house! It's a huge mess! What are you doing to Rosie? That's it. Give her back to me. You have no right to take her away from me. The only one who can raise Rosie with me is her mother, so tell Gwen to come back to me. What? You didn't talk to Gwen about this? Last warning. Tell Gwen to come here and ask to be my girlfriend again. Then I'll consider giving her the baby back. Excuse me, it's father-daughter time now. I fell on my knees like all my strength was drawn away. It's all my fault. I handed Rosie to him. Calm down, Lydia. Let's try contacting your sister first. I called Gwen a million times, but no surprise, she didn't pick up. So I shot her a message about the current situation and asked her to show up ASAP. Me and Augustine waited outside Kyle's house for ages, and right when we were about to give up, Gwen finally appeared. We banged on the door, but that jerk Kyle refused to let us in. Oh, you finally showed up. If you want the brat back that badly, then it'll cost you. Let's say, $5,000? What a low life! Gwen was inconsolable, and Augustine kept trying to kick the door down. Success! We were about to storm in, but then spotted Kyle running off with Rosie and jumped onto his motorbike! Call 911. We've got this. He led me over to his bike, and I clung on for dear life as we chased after Kyle. He was going so fast, and I thought we were going to lose him. Then suddenly, Augustine took a sharp turn up a narrow alley. What are you doing? He went the other way! Trust me, and hold on tight! We whizzed back onto the main road and managed to cut Kyle off at the town square. He tried leaving the baby there and running off, but the cops caught up just in time, and he was arrested. I'm so sorry! I shouldn't have left like that! I put you all in such terrible danger! All I wanted was to make things right! Gwen, it's okay. We're all okay. After that, we all went back to her dorm. Turns out she's now a journalism freshman. And I cannot believe my eyes! How could she live in a place like this? Why are you- My life wasn't full of roses at all. The perfect image that I built up was all fake, and it completely wore me out. But this? This is real. It's what truly makes me happy, so please understand. I- I didn't know that, but I'm glad you found your dream. You'll always be my coolest sister. And with a holding hand, Gwen found the strength to tell our parents everything. They weren't angry at all, and even felt sorry for her carrying all that burden alone. Turns out, it was Gwen who put all the pressure on herself. Mom and Dad even suggested that Gwen move back with them, so they could help her take care of Rosie. Finally, everything was sorted out, except I realized law was not my passion after all. Now, which path should I take? 
Suddenly, Augustine came to me with a wrinkled piece of paper. How about you start with this? Gosh, you still keep it? Let's say I'll give it a try. Hi, it's me again, and today is the grand opening of my baby clothes store. All the clothes here are my own designs. Adorable, right? And my marketing and branding expert, aka my soulmate, is this guy. Oh, of course, my family was also here. Mom, mom. Wow, Rosie had just spoken her first word. Let's take a picture to capture this memorable moment. Three, two, one. Oh no, sweetie. Is it usual for you to sit on strangers the first time you meet them? This jerk. I'll show him that he's messing with the wrong girl. It's fine. Please don't hit him. Don't worry. And this is for mugging a kid. No, no, you've got it wrong. He just saved me from those muggers. And he was just teaching me how to fight back at them. Oh, my. I thought... It was just because the boy's bag was on the ground and that guy was holding his arm like he was about to hit him. I awkwardly stood up, literally screamed out to apologize, then ran straight home. So, as you can see, my home's a little different from the usual. My parents run a nursing home, so I grew up surrounded by the elderly. You were so embarrassed that you left him laying there and ran away? The first time I met my husband... I also knocked him over with my dolio chagi. Perhaps this boy is your destiny. Poof! No way, Mrs. Jones. Suddenly, my dad huffed past us. Oh no, I know that look. Something was bad. Lately, our finances haven't been so good. I went after him to check he was okay and found him talking to a man in the yard. On seeing me, the strange man waved me over. Do you know this person? Huh? That was the guy I almost punched earlier. That's right. The person you almost knocked out is my son. I saw everything, so I followed you here. He's got in with a bad crowd and lost focus on his studies. I want you to steer him in the right direction. I... I don't want to be a babysitter. I'm sorry. It's too bad about this nursing retreat, isn't it? Seems like it'll have to close soon. Although, if swayed, I don't mind being a major sponsor. <gasps> this was insane! So, all I needed to do was keep an eye on his son, and all the nursing home's problems would be solved? Dad said I didn't have to do it if I didn't want to, but how could I say no? Okay, I'll do it! So, which school am I transferring to? Jeez, everything here was so shiny. But if I had a choice... This would be the last school in town I ever wanted to attend. I entered the classroom and walked over to the only empty seat that happened to be at the back. I was about to sit down, then... Ah! Some dude pulled the chair aside and caused me to fall onto my butt. A hand appeared to pull me up, but as I went to grab it, it immediately drew back, leaving me sitting there embarrassed while everyone's laughing at me. Oops, sorry. I guess I should only give a hand when asked, right? Ugh, it was Blake. I quickly regained my cool face, sat down, and put on my headphones, pretending like I didn't hear any of those comments from other students about my rustic look. This girl seems interesting. The usual. A grand if you can win her heart in a month. Deal? Blake glanced at me and sneered at the guy. Easy. Deal. So that's how it's gonna be, is it? Luckily, I hadn't turned my music on yet, hence why I heard the whole conversation. Let me help you get some extra pocket money then, Blake. And it didn't take him long to start implementing his plan. At lunchtime, he enthusiastically led me to the canteen, guided me to get food, and even asked the lunch lady to get me an extra portion of yogurt. Nice try. I was trying to enjoy my lunch when a shrill voice sounded out. Get up and get me some food. I want a cupcake just like yours. Now! Jeez, why did some girls think it was okay to treat guys like this? Frustrated, I went over there, picked up the cake from that boy's tray, and shoved it into her mouth. There, happy now? Poor thing, your arms must be so broken that you can't get food yourself. Let me feed you then. You're welcome. 
Are you crazy? You're dead meat today. She raised her hand about to slap me, but I quickly dodged, causing her to fall to the ground. As for me, I calmly sat down next to the boy and had my lunch. Sorry for wasting the cake. You can have my yogurt if you want. He's Kai, my first friend at this new school. He's witty, smart, and has a seriously impressive academic record. He was actually here on scholarship, which explained why he didn't quite fit in, just like me. I noticed how Blake seemed rather annoyed and kept staring at me. I bet he was just fed up with being teased by his friends, since I just totally ignored him. Oh, but he didn't give up that easily. The next morning, he showed up at mine to pick me up, but I'd rather run two laps around the schoolyard for being late than share a ride with you. Then at school, he tripped me up and then reached out his hand pretending to help. But between you and the floor, I picked the floor. He even waited for me at the school gates with a huge bouquet of roses. But I just took one look at them, then started coughing. Are you allergic to flowers? <coughs> nope. I'm allergic to immature and boring people, like you. Then I walked off. Ugh as if every girl was going to fall for these lame tricks. This carried on for the next few weeks, but then one time, he approached me in the library while I was studying with Kai and handed me a necklace. I looked at it, then passed it back to him and turned to talk to Kai. Seriously? You're turning me down for this nerd? Kai's smart, gallant, and sophisticated, unlike you. All you are is a troublemaker. Are you looking down on me? Oh, finally. I was wondering how much longer would it take for you to figure that out. Not to mention, you've not helped once with the English Lit essay. You're in my group, but you probably just think the Grapes of Wrath is a rock band or something. So, if I can finish that essay on my own, will you go on a date with me? Fine, but it has to score an A, else you can forget it. And my trick worked. Blake actually completed the essay on his own. He's smart, but he's neglectful of his studies, and it's made him make mistakes. On being handed back the essay, Blake's face fell. He got a B, and even though he knew it was over, he still stayed in class to reread the teacher's comments. It seemed like this was the first time he actually put in the effort to do something. <laughs> What's wrong? Still in denial of your failure? Blake turned away without looking at me. The rich boy who lost the game for the first time looked so cute. So I put a gift with a message in it on Blake's desk. Needless to say, he was over the moon. In it was a set of clothes I'd bought for him and an invitation to a bar at the weekend. Why, you wonder? Oh, you'll see. That Saturday night, Blake showed up in the outfit I had gifted him and looked anything but pleased. <laughs> I can't come in wearing this. It's so old-fashioned. My friends will laugh at me. You invited your friends, too? To prove that you won the bet, right? If you get that thousand dollars, will I have a share? You already knew it? I was just joking at first. But now... Let's go inside now. Don't worry. We won't be here for long. I dragged him inside, and immediately, his friends didn't miss the opportunity to tease me. Did the fish get hooked? Yes, I'm trapped. Quickly give him a grand. His family is bankrupt and in dire need of money. Huh? What? You're lying. Look, he's wearing donated clothes. Even his branded clothes have been liquidated. I winked at Blake, and he immediately reacted. Lend me some money. I need a place to stay, a sports car, and pocket money too. At this point, his friends turned nasty and told him he no longer qualified to be in their group. You didn't have to do that. I already knew they only hung out with me for the money. But that's what people are just like. <sighs> Why would he think that? He must have never been cared for and loved properly. Get rid of that face. This is a date, after all. Let me make it up to you. A bar that matches this outfit. So I dragged Blake to our evening party. I told everyone that I brought a friend to lend a hand, and the elderly immediately made him do all sorts of things. Mrs. Hastings asked him to climb the tree to hang the string lights. 
Mr. Derbyshire called him to chop wood for the campfire, and Mr. Shaw wanted him to taste his homebrewed beer. Then the next second, Blake's already sitting on the drum throne. Huh, it's been a long time since we had a young volunteer. That boy seems fine, doesn't he? I saw the way he looked at you. He's not suitable for me. I shrugged in response to her, and suddenly felt disappointed. Yes, I liked this different side to him, but we were still from different worlds. The next morning at school, I still saw Blake hanging out with his greedy friends. Looks like he hadn't learned his lesson. Frustrated that all my efforts were in vain, I swung open my locker. Hmm, what was this note? Meet me at the library at 6 p.m. when everyone has left. I have a surprise for you. B. I shouldn't be like this, right? Waiting for him at the library for hours until everyone left? Nervous and excited? But as soon as the last person left, the lights suddenly went out, and the library door slammed shut. What's happening? Could it be that the note wasn't from Blake? I screamed out of fear. That's right. I may excel at martial arts, but I hate the dark. With a shaking hand, I dialed the phone to call Blake, and then slumped down in fear and sobbed. At that moment, the sound of the door unlocking startled me. As soon as the door opened, I quickly ran to hug Blake. Are you okay? I can't believe Chloe did this. I told you not to get near them. Huh? This wasn't Blake's voice. Freya! Are you okay? Oh my god, it was Kai who opened the door to save me, but I thought that... I quickly let go of him, then ran away in embarrassment. That's strange. When I was in danger, the first person I thought of was Blake. Could it be that I... really liked him? At that moment, the phone rang. It was my dad. Mrs. Jones had suffered a heart attack and needed surgery immediately but the surgery cost was so much. Where could we get that money? Ah, oh, yes. Blake's dad. So I called him. Hello, is this Mr. Morris? Blake stopped hanging out with his friends and did his homework. I really need the money now. Please, it's urgent. Are you bringing me out to trade with my dad? My God. It seems like Blake heard all the conversation. I... I... So, I'm just your money-making tool? And all this time you've trained me as your pet? It's not like that! We'll talk later. There's no time for your selfish thoughts right now. I gotta go! I ran like crazy to the hospital. My parents were desperate, and the money hadn't arrived yet. So I called Mr. Morris again. You said Blake had changed. If this is the case, then why did he just get fined for speeding and resisting police? Don't ever call me again. Don't worry, Freya. I'll sell the nursing home land to take care of Mrs. Jones. Everyone's agreed to move to the government nursing home. We sold our house, and now we live with Mrs. Jones in a new town. She's so much better now, but I do miss the other elderly people. Also, I miss Blake. I still keep in touch with Kai, and he told me that Blake has gone to some military school like his dad wanted. Well, that's unexpected from him. You should talk to that guy. Not about what you did, but confess your feelings to him. That will save you from regrets later. Then she patted me on the shoulder to comfort me. But I really don't have the courage to do it. I was feeling guilty. Mrs. Jones, you have a letter. Freya, look. It's the invitation to a nursing home concert. It's our concert, isn't it? Trembling, I took the invitation. What is this? I pushed Mrs. Jones's wheelchair to the door of the nursing home named Sunflower. When we walked in, we all burst into tears. Everyone was there. This is all Blake's doing. He's such a kind boy. He found us and built us a dream nursing home. You and Freya were the surprise gift we prepared for him, but as soon as he saw the two of you, he ran away. Hearing that, I rushed to the gate. A car passed me. My gut told me it was him. 
I ran after it and shouted in despair, Blake, wait! I like you! I really like you! But the car quickly went out of sight. I helplessly slumped down on the street, tears streaming down my face, and I still muttered, I really do like you. What are you saying? Say it louder. I turned around startled. It was Blake. He was in his military uniform and smiling at me fondly. I was in this romantic dinner date with the love of my life, knowing too well that one day I'd be gone. But I couldn't help but falling for him. I'm in love with you, and I know that love is just a shout into the void, and that we're all doomed, and that there will come a day the sun will swallow the only earth we'll ever have, and I am in love with you. Cut. Excellent, Eleanor. Well, that was the usual in the life of an actress. Oh, hey, didn't catch you there. I'm Eleanor, from LA. My life as a kid was a bit different from others. While they were surrounded by dolls and toys, I was wrapped up in the limelight. Being a superstar seemed fun back then, but the glitz and glamour of showbiz gradually wore me out. My momager never let me take a break between gigs, so there's no time to hang with people my age. You know, I missed out on doing normal things like having sleepovers and going to birthday parties, and before I knew it, I was already swarmed with work and work. Sweetheart, I've got you another script. Take a look. Whatever, Mom. FYI, Jeremiah is also on the show. Seriously? Mom, that heartless jerk cheated on me. No way am I working with him. Eleanor, be professional. I've already signed the contract. Besides, Mommy's Bentley collection is missing this shiny golden one. I don't give a damn about your stupid car. Stop treating me like a GoFundMe for your lavish lifestyle. Mom can be insufferable sometimes. She dictated everything. But why bother now? No showbiz, no mom's orders. I can do whatever I want. Bye-bye salad and hello chocolate cake. But suddenly, a dark figure bolted towards me and snatched my bag. I lost my balance, banged my head on a fire hydrant, and then everything went black. Gosh, my head was spinning. I opened my eyes to see a cute guy leaning over me. Hey, are you alright? Am I dreaming? Cause this view sure is dreamy. <laughs> no, you're not. You're at the orphanage. I found you unconscious on the ground last night, so I brought you here. Excuse me? An orphanage? I can't be in a place like this. But wait, my phone and wallet? Darn it. That thief stole my bag along with everything. Guess I needed to delay my independent life plan just a little bit. I better call mom. Hey, got a phone I can borrow? Suddenly, the TV broadcast a missing report. The young actress Eleanor Mitchell has been reported missing. Speculation is that this is a publicity stunt to promote her latest movie. However, her manager claims this is not true, and urges anyone with information to come forward. Huh, that chick will soon reappear when she's hungry. What? I could be lying dead in a lay-by for all they knew, and they were still mocking me? I was so done with this. Goodbye, showbiz. I was leaving that fickle world behind for real. So, I asked the orphanage's manager if I could stay here and help out. Just then, a group of kids noisily ran towards me and printed their hands on my shirt. No! My custom Chanel! Sis, come play with us! Uh, do I look like a nanny to you? Go wash your hands, dirty children. Shoo! Shoo! Ahem, you're supposed to go play with them? Ah, I forgot about that. I steered away to find another group of kids splashing mud everywhere. Ugh, are they training a bunch of farmers or something? The next morning, this strange screeching noise startled me. It's only 6 a.m. I sluggishly dragged my feet out of the room. People immediately threw me judging looks. I guess my first day at work started off on the wrong foot. I barely had time to sip my coffee before they made me do the washing by hand. This wasn't the dark ages. Hadn't they ever heard of a washing machine? One of the staff got annoyed with me and shooed me away. Alrighty, I'd go help in the kitchen. Peel half of these. Easy peasy. Just give me a few minutes. Voila! I'm good, right? But somehow, they still got mad at me. No other choices. I headed to the children's, but this place is pure chaos. I sure wish I had my earplugs. Suddenly, I felt someone grabbing my leg. I looked down to see the cutest pair of puppy eyes. Sis, can you...
Can I have a bite of that? Aw, how could I say no to that? But as soon as I gave her the cake, her face changed into a devilish grin. The little girl grabbed a big chunk with her bare hand, then smashed it into another kid's face, and the cake fight began! Caleb opened his mouth to say something, and a massive piece of cake flew into it! Oh my god, Caleb, are you alright? I… I didn't know they were gonna mess with the cake! You did this? Oh, you're so dead to me! He grabbed the cake and started chasing me across the room! What? This was so unprofession- Right, that's it. Watch out, Caleb! Okay, so the manager wasn't very happy with us, but honestly, it was the most fun I'd ever had. Besides, after the cake fight, the kids seemed to like me. Whenever they saw me, they clung to my legs and begged me to play with them. One day I was in the garden attending to the flowers, when this little girl ran over to me in tears. Oh, Pumpkin, what's wrong? Bella was adopted a few days ago, but they just brought her back. Poor kid. All I could do was pull her into a warm embrace and pat her back. Do you know what it is these kids crave the most in the world? Not new toys or expensive clothes. They just want love. Love? I never thought something so simple could seem so unreachable to these kids. Well then, this Eleanor will make sure they'll be showered in love from now on. There's still some troubles, but luckily, I had Caleb on hand to help. Then one night, I was sitting outside looking at the skyline when Caleb came over. He leaned across me and pulled something off my cheek. Oops, the kids must have stuck it while I was asleep. <laughs> That's on you for giving them a sticker book. <laughs> um, Eleanor, I, um, I'm glad you're here. I, I really like you and I'm falling in love with you. Will you be my girlfriend? Wow, I wasn't expecting that. But Caleb was a great guy, so being with him made sense, right? and the following days were fantastic. We found out lots about each other. Oh, there's something you might be surprised about me. I used to be an actress. Oh, I didn't expect that. I just think showbiz is kind of toxic. Sorry you feel that way, but believe me, I have no interest in it anymore. Good, because it's all a load of pretentious jerks who think they're so much better than everyone else. Hmm, that's harsh, I guess, but he's right though. Anyway, I've already found fairy tale love right here. But to be honest, I did miss the elaborate sets, the stunning costumes, the dazzling studio lights, and the feeling of morphing into a different character. So sometimes I played out Disney princess roles for the kids. But one time, Caleb stormed in on us. Look at you! You've fallen back into your old ways. Come on, kids. You have better things to do than this. My heart thumped in sadness. Acting was a part of who I was. It seems like he'd never understand that. And I don't want to upset him either. So I guess I had to put aside my passion and just focus on my new life here. One day while skipping towards the playground, I slipped on a banana peel and was about to fall when a strong arm caught my back and helped me to stand up. Surely he did have a strong build and a gentleman manner. But who is this guy? I thanked him, but he just stared at me. You look just like Eleanor Mitchell. Well, I am her. Oh, you left showbiz for real? I thought it was just a media trick. Oof, what was his deal? Was he a reporter coming to dig up dirt? Oh, sorry, just kidding. But are you serious about quitting acting? You've got talent. All you need is a good script to sink your teeth into, instead of those terrible ones you've been given. Huh? Was that considered a compliment? Turns out, he's Frederick, a young screenwriter who came to the orphanage for inspiration and to help out. He even set up a mini theater for the kids to have their first cinematic experience. As you can see, anything's possible in movies. Even our most magical dreams can come true. I suddenly remembered why cinema had captivated me in the first place. It opened the audience to multiple perspectives and worlds. This is the cinema I love and dream of being a part of. And maybe that's why I'm naturally drawn to Fred. He might seem a little playful, but when it came to movies, he turned into another person. I cannot deny that my flame for acting was rekindled by his genuine sharings. I mean, everybody loves Fred. Look! Well, maybe not everyone. Okay, kids, but remember, studying is priority so that you can have a better life. Acting and script writing is just a pipe dream. It's not real. Yes, studying is important, but arts are what we live for, what nurtures us from within. Art has no value. Investing money in arts is like throwing it out the window. There are people who barely have anything to eat. Why not use that money to help them instead? Gosh, these man-children. They looked ready to start a fight, so I had to step up and stop them. After that day, Caleb and Fred were constantly giving each other dirty looks. I tried to calm Caleb down, but he got mad at me for no reason. Things only got worse between them, and I felt awkward with Fred. Just let him be. I don't want his problems to get in between our friendship. 
By the way, I have something for you. Then he showed me his new script and asked me for advice. And guess what? The script was actually based on my life in the orphanage. He'd been inspired by my journey here. It was such a beautiful script, and I felt seen and understood, though we just met not long ago. Then out of nowhere, Caleb angrily bolted towards us. What the heck are you doing? He tried to drag me away, but Fred stopped him. Dude, can't you see you're hurting her? Not your business. Get your dumb writing hands off of her. Stop, Caleb, you're being rude. I'm not done with you, Eleanor. You went behind my back to swoon for this brat and his dumb art. I thought you'd be different, but you're just like them. Once a spoiled actress, always a spoiled actress, huh? So this is how little you think of me? Caleb, listen, acting is what I live for. I even tried to hold it back just to please you. And look where it got me. I'm done hiding my true passion. Caleb, we're over. Caleb looked down and didn't say a word. And after that, he packed his things and left the orphanage. It's true Caleb had opened up something in me, but if being with him meant I had to lose myself, then I'd gotta let him go. The orphanage without him was not the same. Luckily, I had Fred to cheer me up. He asked me to play the lead in his upcoming film project, and with the script based on my journey here, I agreed. It felt good knowing I could finally go back to acting, even if I was sort of playing myself. Then one day, I found a baby left in front of the orphanage. Then I quickly carried him inside. Poor Hector. I'll take good care of you. Mama. That's right. Your mama's here. Dada. I'm your dada now? Together we'll be a happy family. Right, mama? Oh boy. It made my stomach do cartwheels. But was it okay to feel this way after everything happened? We started filming in the orphanage soon, and the kids were a big help. It felt quite strange after a long break. But the thing that got me nervous about was the audience's reaction to the movie. Turns out, I was worried for nothing, as the feedback was actually amazing. Though that joy didn't last long, as a few days after, the image of me holding Hector hit the internet with the headline, Actress Turned Teenage Mum. Through their words, I appeared as this reckless girl who got pregnant and ran away from showbiz to give birth. That got netizens turned 180 and throw shade at me. What a load of nonsense! Right at that moment, I got a text from Caleb. Is this your rotten showbiz? So it's him who leaked that picture to the press! How could he? I've gotta sort this out. Today's the day. It's time to shed light on everything. Hi everyone, today I have an announcement to make. It's true, I have a baby now, and the father of my child is Jeremiah Williamson, my ex. Everyone gasped in shock. Just then, a man in black stood up and revealed himself. Ha! The prey fell for the trap. You, you liar! Everyone stop listening to her lies! Oh yeah? Then Jeremiah, why exactly are you here? He was completely speechless. That's what I thought. Now, Joshua, Jeremiah's private detective, may you please stand up. Among the crowd, both Caleb and Fred forced the detective up to his feet. Tell them what you know. The deal was Jeremiah felt humiliated as I'd refused to work with him, so he decided to hire this Joshua guy to dig dirt on me. That's how he got my picture with the baby. Luckily, Caleb caught the detective sneaking around the orphanage, and together, we set up the trap to lure Jeremiah in. Jeremiah still insisted he had no idea who this Joshua guy is until I showed the evidence of the transactions between him and his detective on the big screen. Any last words? Justice served. Let's see how he handles this scandal. Right at that moment, I spotted a familiar face in the crowd. Mom, I, I hadn't seen her for such a long time. Darling, I'm so sorry. I realize now how terribly wrong I've been. I thought I was helping, but turns out I only smothered you. But you're ready to make your own choices. Please forgive me, and don't leave me again. I'm sorry too, Mom, for leaving like that. I didn't mean to worry you. I threw my arms around her, tears welling up in my eyes. My time in the orphanage has taught me a big lesson. Family isn't always perfect, but they're the most precious thing in the world. Later, I stepped outside to see Caleb waiting there. What a mess. <laughs> Thank you for helping me. Don't mention it. Actually, I should apologize to you first. That day I couldn't control my words because I was jealous. I'm sorry. And one more thing. I still have feelings for you. So can we... I know what you're about to say. But I've come to realize that we're not right for each other. I think I'm in love with someone else. Thank you for being kind to me. I could see the disappointment on his face, but then he gave me an understanding smile. Out of nowhere, the kids jumped out at me and insisted I go to see their paintings. They took me back to the orphanage and each held their own drawing. Hi, Eleanor. You're the most special girl I've ever met. Will you be my girlfriend? Fred appeared in front of me and held out a rose. So, Eleanor, what do you say? Oh, wow. What do you think, kids? That answers then? Yes. Yes, I will. Here 
there I was, standing in the middle of Christian's apartment with a dumbfounded look on my face. I know I dated a lot of guys, but could it really have been so many that I'd accidentally dated this guy twice? I took another look around the room. Oh my god, that hideous lamp and minuscule kitchen looked really familiar. I was feeling uneasy as I sat on the couch and stared at the guitar. Okay, now I was sure that I'd definitely been here before. Panicking, I made an excuse that my favorite TV show was about to start, so I had to go home. Then I ran out of there. From that moment on, I avoided Christian at all costs. He tried to call and message me a bunch of times, but I ignored them all. How was it possible that I couldn't remember dating him? I mean, okay, I suppose I had been on a bit of a dating streak recently, but it was hardly enough to date myself into oblivion, right? Besides, if this was the case, shouldn't he be able to recognize me too? On the day we met, I was in a terrible mood, so was drowning my sorrows in a bar. I had a bit too much to drink, so when I walked out and accidentally bumped into Christian, I began blaming him. But instead of ignoring a drunk girl, he made sure I got home safely. After that, I don't know if it was by accident, fate, or if Christian was stalking me, but I seemed to run into him all the time. Hey, if the universe wanted us to hang out, then who was I to stop it? So I started talking to him and turns out we got on really well. Then, of course, came that day when he dropped the bombshell. He said he likes me, and I kind of like him too, so we started dating. Now, did you see how wrong this was? If I'm his ex, then why did he approach me? Also, I mean, what are the odds for the both of us to just have zero recollection of each other? Or was he pretending not to know me? If so, then what were his purposes? Ugh, the best thing to do is to dump him first, right? Problem solved. But then one day, I got home from college to find Christian standing at my door with a bunch of groceries. He came by to cook me dinner. Oh, that's kind of sweet. Well, seeing as he's here, I should hold off on breaking up with him until after dinner, right? But man, it was so hard. All I could think about was how caring and thoughtful he was. Then suddenly, he said something that messed up my whole plan. My roommates are terrible cooks, especially my brother so the two of them pester me to make all of their meals. Wait a minute, did he just say brother and roommate? So it turns out he wasn't living alone. What a relief! That means there was still hope that I could have dated his brother or his roommate, not him. I just needed to figure out which one it was. I needed to find out more about them, so I praised him for more information. He told me that his brother was dumped by his ex in the worst way possible. He'd arranged a romantic dinner at a restaurant, and while he was talking, she screamed out that she wanted to break up. It was not only devastating for him, but also humiliating. Oh. My. God. That sounded so familiar. Because I often did that too. It's like my signature move. Could it be that the person I dated was his brother, Connor? If yes, then that would be great. It means I could continue dating Christian, right? To be honest, I really hope it's Connor. So all I needed to do was meet the guy and let him confirm it. But easier said than done. The guy was never home. Until one night. Christian and I were at a bar when we heard some loud noises coming from the booth next to us. A guy was yelling at a couple. Seeing that, Christian immediately ran over to them and stopped the guy. Turns out the guy yelling was Connor, and the couple were his ex and her new boyfriend. So... She was the one who broke up with him in that terrible way, not me? Now it's either Christian or his roommate. While I was in deep thought, Christian came back with two hot dogs in his hands. Hey, Christian! Suddenly, we heard someone calling his name. We turned around to see two guys standing behind us. It was none other than Christian's roommate, Wes, and his... Boyfriend! Yes, you heard me right, his boyfriend! So that means I didn't date him either? After that, I couldn't pay attention to the game anymore. In what way could this all make sense? But wait, maybe I was wrong. I mean, many apartments look the same, don't they? Seeing me zoning out, Christian nudged my arm, then handed me a hot dog. I thanked him and was about to take it when he snatched it back. Oh wait, 
You hate ketchup, because you always get ketchup stains on your clothes. Here, take this one. What did you just say? How did you know that? Oh, you did tell me once, don't you remember? I just gave an awkward smile. I'm 100% sure I hadn't told him that. So, there's no denying, Christian is my ex-boyfriend. It's settled. I'm breaking up with him. That night, I couldn't sleep, as all I could think about was Christian. He obviously remembered me because he knew about the ketchup thing. But why the act? Oh my, he definitely wants revenge. I'm sure of it. But, ugh, why did this suck so much? He was just some guy. I could find another boyfriend easy enough, right? But chances are, they wouldn't be as sweet and caring as Christian was. <sighs> One time when I was stressing out about my essay, he stayed up late so he could read it through for me and point out any typos. And whenever I was feeling down, he would send me a cake. Sometimes a box of donuts with a little note to cheer me up. I was definitely going to miss his cute ways, but I couldn't do this anymore. He had to go. So the next day, when I met Christian for lunch, I decided to take the opportunity to break up with him. But before I could say anything, we ran into a guy who claimed to know me. Oh my god, is that you, Sadie? Huh? Who is he? Oliver? My god, long time no see. You know Sadie? Christian? Hey, what a small world. Yeah, um, we used to date. My god. Guys, guys, this is Oliver, who happened to be Christian's former roommate, which, apparently, my ex. He used to live with Christian before Wes moved in. So that means, hooray! Christian wasn't my ex and wasn't longing for revenge. Yay! Although, it's kind of weird that Oliver didn't look at all familiar to me. Hmm, maybe I really did need to stop dating so much. This is crazy, but it made me realize something. I really had fallen for Christian. So I decided to set up a romantic dinner in a nice restaurant so I could tell him. Christian, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I love you. I eagerly awaited for him to say it back, but no. Instead, he burst out laughing. Huh? And that's when everything came to light. Guess what? Christian really is my ex. When we were at the basketball match, I made a big mistake with the ketchup thing. I sensed you were sus, so I asked Oliver to pretend to be your ex. And it worked. <laughs> but, but why? What did I do to you to deserve that? Oh, wow, you really don't remember, huh? Well, just proves what a terrible person you are. You don't care what love is. You just like to mess with people's feelings, then move on to your next victim. Well, let me refresh your memory. We used to be a happy couple. Until one day you decided to end things without even an explanation. Right when I was having the hardest time. Things didn't go well at work and my mom was sick in the hospital. Did you know how heartbroken it made me feel? I... Then a month ago, when I saw you dump that guy in public, then walk past me without even recognizing me, I knew everything was a joke to you. So I came up with this plan, and I don't regret anything. Then he stood up and walked off. What? That couldn't be true, right? Because I had no recollection of what Kristen just said. But he seemed adamant it was true, so I went to see my doctor. Actually, ever since the accident, I haven't been back here for any extra checkup. And you know what? After several tests, I was diagnosed with memory loss. Well, that explained a lot. You see, a few months ago, I had a bicycle accident. I fell off a cliff, but luckily it wasn't high. I bumped my head, but I thought I was okay, as I still remembered my family and friends. Turns out, I only lost the memory about the period of time when I was dating Christian. How ironic. <sighs> but it was a big misunderstanding. You know, I have this bad habit that every time I feel someone is getting distant towards me, I save face by dumping them first. So maybe when Christian was busy taking care of his mom in the hospital, I misread the situation and ended things with him. Ugh, he was right. I am a horrible person. I can't believe I let an amazing guy like him go. But nope, not this time. I believe the universe gave me a second chance. That's why I met him again. So I ran to Christian's apartment to explain everything to him. 
but when I knocked on the door, Wes opened it. You just missed him. He's heading to the airport to visit his parents for a few weeks. What? I couldn't wait two more weeks? So I took a cab to the airport. But on the way, I got stuck in traffic. Ugh! How am I supposed to find him now? Wait a minute. I've seen this scene play out many times in movies. So, can you guess what I did next? Yep, I stepped out of the taxi and ran like a crazy person up the road. I looked into each taxi, hoping to find Christian and... Do you believe it? I finally found him. He looked very shocked when he saw me getting into his cab. Before you kick me out, please let me explain. Then I began to tell him about my mom and how my dad and countless other men abandoned her. I was left terrified of being abandoned by someone I love, so my own irrational fear meant that when Christian was busy taking care of his sick mom, I thought it was a sign that he was about to dump me. So I ended things first with him. It's not because you didn't mean anything to me. On the contrary, you made me feel safe. I just like you so much that I didn't want to get hurt by you. Then I explained to him about my accident and why I don't remember him. Christian remained silent and kept his head down. It seemed like he didn't want to give me another chance. I tried, but I couldn't make him forgive me. So, feeling glum, I opened the car door to get out. But Christian took my hand and said, Sadie, I have missed you. Okay, fine. Let's give it another try. So that was it. Christian gave me a second. Oh, wait. Actually, it's the third chance. <laughs> and can you guess what we did next? Well, I'm now sitting at the airport with Christian, waiting for our flight to his hometown to meet his parents. I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. Wish me luck.